Welcome back to another episode of The Strange Road. We have another fantastic interview for you guys. VJ is back. That's right, baby. If you remember the last time we talked about the connections with the Serpent Mound in Ohio and Kundalini Yoga, and VJ laid out a really awesome presentation. But this episode, we're going to dig even deeper and talk about other temples in India and Mexico and more mound earth earthen pyramid complexes here in Ohio. VJ thinks the name mound isn't really correct in that back in the past, in ancient times, the earthworks were more than likely pyramids covered in stone as well. And we talk about the Miamisburg Mound in particular, where VJ thinks that it may have been an octagon or hexagon shape in ancient times. That is also next to a river system. One temple in India that he compares to Mound City in Chillicothe, Ohio, and how the river systems flow next to it, and the layout of both of those temples and the similarities. And it's a fantastic conversation. Another interesting thing we get into is the layout that the Freemasons used for Washington, D.C. And if you've ever been there, all the monuments, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, these are temple complexes. And the way they're laid out in such a way is really fantastic. Wait till you hear what VJ has to say about that. It was awesome. And we really appreciate you guys, as always. And hit us up. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at The Strange Road. We've actually been streaming on Twitch. You can check us out at twitch.tv slash The Strange Road. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Hit that notification button so you keep up to date with all the stuff we got going on and all the content we're putting out. We really appreciate you guys, and I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I did. Have a great one. Take care, y'all. How's it going, man? How you been? It's going good. Thank good. you very much, Mike. It's How been are you a while. Doing? Good, good. Yes, yes. Man, I was so happy to see you today. When you walked in, I saw the beard, and I was like, oh, this is going to be a great... You look, You look all... You know, you got your mystics beard on today, so <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, again, for those of you who may not remember, DJ, just give us a little background about yourself. Sure, I'm from India. I've been here in the U.S. for the past four and a half years now. This country has given me a different uh, perspective about the world itself. I'm not talking about the modernization of the society. I'm talking about the ancient things that I found in this country very mysterious and also puzzling. A um, lot of people don't know that these places exist in the US. So that's one of those things that I discovered after coming here. It was amazing to see these sites and, and some of those remains which still remain here to give us a lot of information. I started investigating on all of these things. Um, it was an eye opener. The whole research that I did is an eye-opener for myself because when I saw this country from outside, when I'm seeing this country, I wouldn't see a country, a geography from inside it. And when I'm seeing it the way I'm seeing, not like the other people who are exploring Hollywood and Disneyland, I'm exploring this country in a different way. So this gives me an enhanced knowledge about what I was researching back in India. So this has kind of uh, given me multi-fold of knowledge that I did not expect to get out of this region at all. So that's, that's what I'm working on right now. So um, I got to meet some amazing people here like you yeah. guys, mm -hmm. you dedicated people like you guys. <laughs> so that kind of motivates you. me. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. So that definitely motivates me to pursue more in this and to establish uh, something better than what I was doing before. So, yeah, and I got this presentation done for you. So we're so, going to be connecting the dots. What are we connecting? Again, yes. We're connecting the dots again, ladies yes. and gentlemen. So what we're talking about here is VJ's really uh, got inspired from noticing 
a lot of things in Hinduism and from his own culture and seeing things here in Ohio uh, with mounds and earthworks and kind of noticing similarities. And and uh, so, yeah, I'll let you kind of take over, man. You've, you've really dug into this stuff, and I, I love it. Yes. So the extra piece of dots that I connected are more interesting than those dots that we connected the last time. Gives more information, more connections, and makes me not to stop these connections. So we have a lot more to touch, but for now we're going to touch a little bit of what I have researched till now. So this this is still the tip of the icebergs. We're going to be discussing a lot, but still it's just a little bit of information of what we can actually dig up. Okay. So... Yeah, let's go into that. Yeah, um, let's do it. Start with these mounds that we have here. All the mounds in the U.S., there are so many mounds here. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there are mounds right in their backyard. When they are driving across a mound, they don't know that they are driving across a mound or an ancient site at all. I've seen um, government offices built right on top of mounds, uh, buildings, built across ancient sites. So cemeteries, c- cemeteries, yes, <laughs> golf courses yeah. <laughs> and so many other things built on top of these things. Yeah. Pretty much makes me feel like they want to hide something. So when I saw the remains of what we have here, for some reason I didn't want to call these mounds. These mm-hmm. they have the specific reasons to be called as pyramids. It's if the same shape of structure is in another country, like in a Middle East country. In Egypt, they would call it a pyramid. Mm-hmm. So we have similar structures in India, which we call temples because of the religious importance that we give to those mounds. So it is the same geometrical shapes that we have in different regions, including yeah. Antarctica, but they have been given different names. So the brand name for these structures in the U.S. is mounds. And it's very important to see that these mounds, these are not mounds. These Mm. are mound complexes Mm -hmm. or pyramid complexes. Right. So that's pretty much what we're going to see in the first set of this uh, program. So, And there are different kinds of mounds, which we're going to get into. Yes. There's earthworks and mounds are kind of their own separate thing. But then there's also mounds that vary between each other. Correct. Which we'll kind of show you some examples here. I've got a couple of uh, commonly found mounds. One is the conical mound. It's pretty much a cone put on the earth. The other one is a ridgetop mound. Ridgetop mound is a a mound which doesn't connect at one point, but it connects on a line. Uh, The geometrical shape would be a triangular prism. So these ridgetop mounds that I saw made me think that these have been built for the same reason that we have ridgetop mounds back in India. So I want to show you a little bit of uh, those mounds back in India and all this conical mounds on the left side that you see. Uh, what, these are all like thousands of years old mounds. We're not talking about anything from hundreds of years or a thousand year old, but these are like 2,000, 3,000 or much older mounds that we're looking at. Right. And the right side is the ridge top pyramids that we're looking at. One of them is a very famous one, the one that's on the right top, the, the Kerala, South India. Yeah. This is a very famous place because this is the place where they got the biggest treasure of all time. Mm. It's in billions. It's somewhere around like 9 or 10 billion worth wow. of gold and other things. That's because they've opened two doors out of three doors, and the last door is unable to be opened. And they say they, they have to have specific type of mantras thrown into the door to open that and it's guarded by two snake gods, wow. Naga gods. Right. So the two doors that they opened, they got so much treasure out of it. It's not just a treasure. There's so much more hidden in that. They say there's a Vimana hidden in there. Wow. It's, yes, they say there is a... Uh, a Vimana is an ancient uh, flying machine. Correct. In uh, the sacred texts of uh, India. Yes. It mentions about Vimana. Wow. So... 
We don't know if, we, if they already opened this and not telling us the truth of what they found inside. So Let's how long ago did they open this and supposedly find all this treasure? It's around like five or six years ago. Oh, that's probably. it? Yeah, that's oh, it. Oh, I was thinking like there was an expedition in like the 1700s and they found all this gold. So they just, was there like an underground chamber or something that just, I mean, is this not open to the public where people couldn't just walk into it or? People could walk into the temple, but they're not allowed to go into that, those chambers There's where they found the treasures. Yes. Right, right. These chambers okay. are guarded by police all the time, like armed forces guard this place because of the amount of treasure inside that. Right. The amount of gold that they got outside and the treasure could imbalance the whole finance of India. So that's mm. the kind of treasure we're looking at. Right. So it could bring the value of gold down. So Wow, because that, there's so much more gold in the market. Correct. And that's just, wow. Gold's value is measured by its rarity. So yes. if, if this, this much of gold is dug out, it could bring down the value of gold. Wow. And so many other things that we cannot actually you know, set a value for. Certain sure. things we cannot set a value for. We cannot set a value for the pyramid, right? Right. Even though it's like made of like material, we cannot. So ancient documents or document. like those are treasures too. Correct. Like information you know? in the yep. documents. Yeah. Absolutely. Information is dangerous. Ancient information is dangerous. Correct. I mean, look at, uh, remember when ISIS was destroying all those ancient temples in Lebanon and Syria? Why do you think they were doing that? Because they can control the outcome of, of what they want history to be. Right. You know, they don't want those people to have that ancient wisdom, ancient knowledge. So sometimes you have people in history that want to destroy those scrolls, Correct. you know, whether it's the, um, the, the, the Spanish, uh, the Catholics in, you know, the Yucatan and Peru and the codexes and from the Mayans and just all gone. Yes. Yeah, that's, oh. It's a very common it's practice of invaders. Yeah. When they invade a, a, an old civilization... One of the most important things that they destroy is a library mm -hmm. or a university, yep. uh, mainly where all the information is stored. Oh. So a lot of information stored in these temples have been destroyed too. They've been either destroyed by natural calamities or mm -hmm. uh, termites or just because they've not been preserved properly or right. copied properly or transferred to the next generation properly. But that's not what we're going to go, go into because it's a whole big topic by yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. Let's keep it's, on track. Right. So, <laughs> I will derail us. <laughs> so th these things, these similarities that I'm talking about between these conical mounds and these ridgetop mounds, Yeah. I'm not saying these are the same just because they are the same shape. Right. We cannot do that. It's not quite logical to do that because... Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to construct something would construct that in a particular shape, so it has right. a stable structure. Sure. So we cannot just conclude saying that this is the same because it's of the same shape. Right. So there's more to this. There's more similarities to this. Um, and one of the main places in Ohio that you can gain this information from or you can see and observe and conclude on this is the Chilicate. Okay. Hopeful Cultural National Historical Park. Yeah, and if you guys haven't been there, you should really check this place out because it, it's a rebuilt site, but they did the best at that time. I think they thought they were doing the best they could to, once it was dug up and excavated. They rebuilt this, but it's one of the only sites where you can walk in and see an um, actual mound complex, and it, it extends beyond that, but this particular spot that VJ is going to talk about is sort of in this squared off with um, earthwork embankments around it, and then you'll see, um, like he's saying, the ridge top mounds or pyramids, and then the conical mounds uh, as well, so this is really cool. Correct. I appreciate you using the word complex. Yes. This complex is one of the important features of this place. Right. Because other places where you go, you would just get to see just mounds. For example, if you go to Miamisburg Mount, yep. there's just one big mound standing there. Right. There's nothing else. So people think that it's just a mound. This place conveys some information that other mounds don't. This place says these are mound complexes. Mm -hmm. When you see these mound complexes, it Look kind of that. gives us a bigger idea of how, how or why these places would have been constructed. And this is what I saw when I, see, when I wanted to see how these structures that. were built. I saw a square complex inside which there were mounds. Right. And this was an artist's uh, a reproduction of this place from an aerial view. He's got some huts inside there trying to mention that there were people living on inside these complexes, but I don't think they did because 
this mound is this mound complex is so similar to a Hindu temple back in India. Hmm. When I walked in there, that's what I felt. Hmm. I'm not going to get into the mythical part of where I felt the vibes, the same vibes. Sure. But I'm not going to get into that because I don't have the evidence to prove that. But I'm going to tell you what I saw yeah. and everybody else can see for themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a Hindu temple, this is the same blueprint of the structure that they use to build a Hindu temple. Almost all the temples. There are different types of temples. Yeah. The most famous ones are these temples, especially temples of Lord Shiva. These are square-shaped complexes inside which they have multiple pyramids. And this is always by a river. Mm. Water. B water. Yep. Especially a river. Mm -hmm. Not a lake, not, a, not an ocean, but especially a river which has current in it. Right. Like a water current in it. And that's why we find so many here in Ohio, because we have the Ohio River Valley. Correct. is a very extensive river system that goes all the way to the Ohio and then into the Mississippi. So from all the way through that whole area is just all the way to St. Louis is you can find mounds everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. And for some reason, I, w I would think that these all these mounds are connected to each other. There might be different tribes of people taking care of these mounds, but at some point, there weren't any tribes of people. There were like one set of people in this whole continent who were all connected by these mounds. Well, we know they were trading right. with each other, for sure. I mean, that's... Mainstream archaeologists agree that, you know, they find, um, you know, only flint that you can find in North Carolina. There's, uh, you know, artifacts here in Ohio that were found from sandstone and, you know, New Mexico or Arizona. So seashells. Exactly. Seashells from the Gulf Coast have been found in mounds here in Ohio. Shark tooth. Yeah. Shark tooth. Yeah. Those are like trading material. They right. use them as some money. So. It means that somebody traveled all the way from Atlantic Ocean all the way to Ohio. That's amazing. And did some kind of trading of course, exchange. Of work. course they did. They did. People were capable right. of traveling, traversing the oceans. Yes. And bringing information just, you know, um, I, I think that people came here from all over. I think the bearing, uh, the, the land bridge was part of that. Um, but I also people, I feel like people were coming from other parts of the coasts and down into South America and Correct. from, you know, all oceans. You're talking about Bering Strait uh, theory. That's one of the most absurd theories I've ever, ever heard. Sure. Imagine you living in close to the North Pole and you want to travel during winter, like core winter. Right. The Bering Strait forms a bridge only during the winter. Right. And it's like extreme winter where you have 10 feet of snow. So the Bering Strait theory says that somebody decided to travel from one continent to another unknown terrain right. during core winter in the North Pole. That's <laughs> like the most absurd thing that I've ever heard. People hibernate during winter. They don't travel from one place to another place. Right. There's no reason for somebody to travel. It means death. Yeah. So I think it was, uh, they say at that time it was all frozen because that was during the Ice Age. So it wasn't just in the winter time, but that whole area was frozen the entire time. So if that's the case too, you know, I, would they be traveling animals that are traveling across the bridge to, you know, hunting mammoths? And that's that's the theory. This is not is they're following the, animals into North America. Batting straight theory follows the Ice Age. It is not during the Ice Age. Okay. So the whole thing has happening happening during a season which is a normal season like now. Mm -hmm. Ice Age was, there was no migration at all. People did not want to migrate at all. They were just locked in. Locked in where they yeah. were. People who <laughs> survived. Trying to survive, yeah. Yes, they They're were just trying to, to survive. Right. Even if it's right, there are so many other things that we could come up with to dismiss that theory. Yeah. And I, I personally think that Bering Strait theory was proposed to dismiss other valid theories mm -hmm. that would bring people together. Right. Bring cultures together. And make it seem like, hey, we were all connected in the past. Correct. Why Why are we struggling to be connected now? Correct. We were talking a little bit about this earlier. Right. Let's not get super sidetracked. This is interesting. This Hindu temple. Mm -hmm. Go through some of these uh, sections here, what you have pointed out. Sure. I'm going to show you some of these temples from India. This yeah. temple that we're looking at in Chidambaram, Tamil Nadu. Okay. 
This is the most important Shiva temple in okay. the world. This temple is dedicated to the cosmic form of Shiva. There are five forms of any life, earth, water, fire, uh, air, and cosmos. So this temple is dedicated to the cosmic form of life, a cosmic form of Shiva. There are so many features in this temple that makes people wonder how people even knew all these things. Right. I'm not going to get it deep into that, but I'm going to tell that this is one of those big mound complexes in India that is by a river. And look at this Chilikate, the Hopewell National Park. Yep. This is also by the river. Oh, yeah. This That's is the Sayota, right? Sayota right. River. Yes, it is, yeah. And this is Miamisburg. The Miamisburg Mound is somewhere over here. Mm -hmm. And this is like close to 10 miles between this and this. Right. You're, the, when you're on top of the Miamisburg Mound, you can look over across everything. Correct. Because it's on the high side of that riverbank. Correct. So when you drive up above, down into that valley, you see that mound towering over the whole yes. area. Yes. I mean, it's a spectacle yes. to drive upon. And it used to be about 30 foot taller. It was quite substantially bigger. Um, but when they dug into the top of the mound during excavations in, I think, like the early 1900s, they just never put the dirt back. So it got wow. pulled out. So when they just reshaped the top of it, it lost massive amounts of height. And it's not a small mound now. So imagine that Miamisburg Mound bigger and in its glory right. in ancient times. I can believe that. Amazing. Right. It it definitely lost its original structure because it's right. I don't think it was a conical pyramid. It might have been a an, an octagonal pyramid. Hmm. Interesting. When I was standing on top of it, I saw an octagonal uh, shaped okay. seat place that made me think that it could be an octagonal one. I mean, you got to think if it was an octagon, it could be over time that those shapes are going to eventually smooth out into a cone correct so i'm, I'm next time i go there i'm going to take a look at that I, yes. you did mention that octagon which I, I know there has been mounds uh that are different shapes not right. just you know your traditional circular or even rectangular right <clears throat> but not just these pyramid complexes from usa and india if you look at the tot Khan in mexico yep. it's the same you would find a big pyramid complex right by the river. Yeah. Same with Cahokia Mounds too. The Cahokia oh, yeah. Mounds is the largest mound complex in the U.S. They are right next to the river. Yeah. This is one place that kind of disappointed me when I visited Chichen Itza, Mexico. Yeah. I couldn't find a river there. And later, I discovered that there is a subterranean river running right underneath right. the pyramid. Because there's so much limestone caves and cenotes underground Correct. in that area. Correct. Now, when we were when I was there on the back side, so that image there on the on the left, mm -hmm. behind and to the north, there's a sacred cenote, is what they called it. Our tour guide took us back there. It's not usually on the tour. Now they found ar different artifacts and um, bones and different things like that, um, and that was from what she was saying was their water source, and it wasn't that far. So I don't know if that was the source of the water for their civilization, what do you think is, is there something else feeding into that cenote? I appreciate you bringing that up. Mm -hmm. This looks perfectly like somebody want, want to start a civilization in some location. Yeah. The first thing that they would look for is water, mm -hmm. but not just water, they want pure water. Right. They don't want to die of a pandemic because pandemics right. were the biggest threat of all civilizations in those days. Interesting. Purified <laughs> water is what anybody needs to survive yeah. and start a civilization based on farming or herding or anything else. These guys are basically purifying water and storing them in these tanks. Yeah. So do we have tanks in these pyramid complexes? All of them do. Tanks, water yes. tanks. It's like just a, like a swimming pool. A holding, like yes. uh, a cistern is Correct. what we would call that. I Correct. grew up out in the country and a lot of people had a cistern built in underneath their house where the rain would just come in and collect in this mm -hmm. like big giant bathtub mm -hmm. that's kind of like an, in a crawl space. So right. it's similar to that where they're like building uh, basically uh, rock walls to contain the water. Correct. These, wow. these store pure water where you can actually go sanitize yourself. You don't have to just drink the water. You can bathe in that. And bathing in that water is highly recommended in India. If you go to a temple, right. there are specific things that you do inside a temple. 
one of the most important things is that you have to bathe in there. Right. There's a river right next to it, but people don't bathe in there. Hmm. They come to a pond and bathe in there saying that it's a blessing from God, but it's not. It's a sanitizing method where hmm. you sanitize yourself when you immerse in that water right. that has been purified inside this pyramid. Right. What do we know about all these pyramids here? We know nothing. But what do we know about pyramids in India? We know so many things about yeah. it because it's a continuous civilization and people yes. have been doing the same thing over and over again for thousands of years. Right. So one time you visiting a Hindu temple would give you so big, vast difference in your perspective towards a, towards right. a pyramid. Right. Because if you go in, inside a pyramid, like a temple in India, you have to follow so many things. And if you just follow all those things, by the time you come out of the place, your mind, your body, your spirit, everything is purified and you're ready to live your life. Right. So not all the temples do that because some temples, they've been like demolished, not, ta not been taken care of. So people don't visit that temple because people don't do the right things inside those temples. But there are some temples in which they are in operating condition mm -hmm. where people go and do all those things that they are supposed to do. I'm looking at all these pyramids in the U.S. the same way. Before the invasion happened, before everything, everything was destroyed, so many things have been happening here in the U.S. And we're going to come up with a lot, lot other things. I researched so many other things and found out that this is not what we are looking at. It's not a mound at all. Okay. Calling them mounds make people think that it's a burial chamber, which it's not. Right. A lot of people think that people were buried here and they were building a mound on top of dead bodies. Right. They are not burial chambers at all. But they found burials in them. Correct. Because because of the vast time difference between the Do you think that time. maybe they were a, a civilization that came along later? Correct. And actually dug into it and buried their dead because it was already a sacred site? Or how did they get in there? I don't think the people who live here are the ones who build the mounds at all. These mounds were here for a much longer time. Okay. People have been coming and going here for a long time now. Sure. Just like in any other country, in any other geography. It's nothing to be offended of, first of all. Oh, I'm not it's offended at all. People have been living here and they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. People have been living in Egypt for thousands of years, and they don't know what a pyramid I is. I mean, I didn't know much about mounds and earthworks until I was in my late 20s. I knew about the Serpent Mound. There was a mound here, right here in Columbus, that I went to a few times. But I didn't know that there were thousands of them, and I didn't know what earthworks were. Right. I didn't realize that some of these places are aligned to the solstices, the equinox. There's moon calendars. Um, the octagon is a 18.6-year lunar calendar. So when I started learning about how advanced the geometry and the mathematics, I just, we were never taught this in school. I mean, I grew up here and we have some of the most ridiculous ancient sites right here in our own backyard and I didn't know anything about it. So I had been to Chichen Itza and I had been to uh, Chaco Canyon, New Mexico and had at that point had no clue that these similar temples are right here that I could just literally jump in my car and go to these places. So I started seeing them alongside the road once I got hip to it and started just stopping in and became obsessed and, and frustrated because some of the places have museums and are protected. But for the most part, we only have a thousand out of 10,000 mounds here in Ohio left. And so when you look at just how we haven't done much in our culture to give whoever these folks were credence or even try to understand what they were. I mean, I think in the eight, early 1800s, I think they were really trying to figure out what these were. And somewhere along the way, they just lost, uh, you know, power structures and, and academia gets kind of involved and they can only teach certain things. And so you have information that gets kind of polluted. And so we don't have that long tradition like you do in India. So nobody knows what the hell they are. So when I'm just going out on my own researching, you know, and, and just trying to learn anything I can and like what you're doing, trying to connect the dots. And it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought up a couple of things in this. One is the, the geometrical importance given to these structures. And the second one is that how it's in aligned to 
the equinox. Mm -hmm. If it's burial chambers, there is no much need to give it so much importance in these right. extra things that we are talking about. Well, the about ones the that mountains. are aligned to the stars never found, they never had bodies in them. Correct. Like Sype and some of those. And even Miamisburg, I don't know. I know they found there's burial mounds around the bigger complexes that were maybe later civilizations. But the mound complexes themselves, there's not really bodies found in them. Correct. And some of these bodies found gave a wrong and, um, kind of perspective about this, that they are much earlier, which it's not. They are much older. Right. This, this connection that you're talking about that happened in the 1800s, I strongly believe that this kind of disconnection happened like 11 or 10,000 years ago due to climate changes. Hmm. The people who build the mounds were not are, are the same people who are living here, but the disconnection is what made them different. Okay. The, the whole civilization that we are seeing here now is from a 10,000 year old civilization. Hmm. These mounds are from the previous civilization, the people who built those mounds. Right. And the people who are buried here are the ones from the later part, not from the first part, who built mm -hmm. the mounds. Let's not get into that. No. Because that's, a, again, a whole big topic to talk about. Yeah. Because that's another topic for another episode. Well, I mean, us. even in <laughs> Egypt, there's the old kingdom, there's like the current era, right. and then there's the king's list, which mm -hmm. goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and they say it's myth. Right. Um, but, you know, even in Sumeria, there's different ages of of that area right. um, in their mythology. I think, why not here too? Correct. You it's, know, exactly. It, it's the same thing in India too. Mm -hmm. All these temples that you look at in India would be decorated so much, unlike yeah. in any other countries. And all the decorations have been done by the kings who did it on purpose. They wanted to make sure that it's preserved for the next generation. Sure. They've been doing this for over a few thousand years. Yeah. If you look at Angkor Wat, mm -hmm. somebody went all the way from India, from South India mm -hmm. to Cambodia to just build a temple, right. which is like the largest complex in the whole world. What is pushing him to do that is a question. But right. all these places have been renovated so many times in the past. We are looking at a crude construction which has not been renovated because of whatever happened in this piece of land. But right. all the other places have been renovated so many times. If you look at Egypt, the pyramids that are sitting on, the platform on which the pyramid is sitting is much older than the pyramid. And the Sphinx is much older than the platform. Yeah. And unlike most people believe, there's not been a single body, single mummy found in the, inside the pyramids. No, there hasn't. It's a myth. And they call it the king's tomb and the queen's chamber, the queen's tomb. Absurd. There's no body found there. Correct. Yeah. So if, if it's not for bodies, what is it for? It's for something else. Again, we'll discuss about that in episode three. Okay. <laughs> So this subterranean, so basically uh, pretty much every temple is by some sort of water. You're talking about the purification process of the temple and using that for bathing and healing. And, and um, it's, it, it, yeah, I mean, there's always water yes. incorporated into these. Yes. So these are a couple of uh, temples that are like really big, really, really big. They are like acres and acres of land. These are the missing parts in Chilicothe. If you go to Chilicothe, you won't see those pyramids at the entrance. Okay. But you would see the entrance. Right. You would see the right entrance, left entrance, the back and the front one. You would see the mounts inside it, but you won't see the pyramids on top of that. Those are the things that I think have been robbed. Okay. Those wall, the wall that you see around right. should have been built with stone. Right. Because all the people who are discovering things here, the unrecorded discoveries, which are more important than the ones that, did, that have been recorded, everything is built by stones. There's a guy called Matt Adams. He's on uh, Facebook. He's trying to explore all the northeast Ohio's um, old ancient places. Yeah. He's been discovering so many places, and all these places have been built by rocks, like granite rocks. Mm. I'm doubting that this place is missing the rock covering on all of these. Sure. It's kind of robbery. Like they've taken the main things off and left the 
right. basic foundation they for the people the to come They took the stone to see. build whatever right. they needed to build. Right. And so we, what's left is the sand and the earth right. and the dirt. So the, the veneer, if you will, you're saying is, is gone. Gone. So these may have looked similar to temples in India and pyramids that we see around the world. Correct. But right now, we call them mounds because they don't really resemble that. Because there's no stones. Stones gone, right? right? Right. Is that what we're talking about here? Yes. All right. So, okay. So we have some similarities in the shape and the place it's located by the river and uh, the pyramids inside the complexes. So are they enough? No, they're not. For me, it's not. I'm a logical person. I want to have some more logics to it. You too. want the data? Yes. So I'm looking at more similarities just like this. Anchor this Watt. is the same pattern, the same blueprint in all the other temple complexes. You take Angkor Wat, you take Giza complex, and also Taj Mahal. There's a reason that I put Taj Mahal in here, yeah. even though a lot of people believe that it's a, um, an Islam, Muslim structure. Uh, there are a lot of people who believe that this is a Shiva temple that has been modified by It was the, a gift to his girlfriend or his wife. His or wife is, is that what the story is? Yes, it is. Okay. But nobody believes that it, it is a... In India, nobody buys it? A lot of people don't. A lot, lot yeah. of people who know about these things, who have been researching about these things, yeah. they, they want to get into the hidden chambers beneath it. Oh, yeah. They want to know what's inside there. Right. And on the top, they see, see this marvelous structure made of limestone. Yeah. And beneath it, there is a rocky structure that is not shown to the public. You cannot access it. Even like high government, government officials cannot go access these places. Wow. It's completely locked up. Okay. And there's a whole big city based off this pyramid. Wow. If you look at this place from aerial view, you would see that how big of a city could be based out of a pyramid complex. Right. That will give you a perspective of how these Cahokia mounds, the Chilicate mounds, would have been a center of a whole big civilization. Sure, like this. Exactly. Like Anchor Wat. Right. Because there's other sites. There's Anchor Tom, There's, mm -hmm. uh, and they're sort of aligned with each other, but this is sort of the center of a larger complex correct that this is a complex within a complex correct that's See, where it starts to get crazy correct if you look at this the the chidambaram temple it's hard to see how big that is but if you just look at those houses correct around it you can really get an eye idea of that's what how i'm talking massive about that area is you got an eye mike yeah. because this is the actual temple now if okay. you go visit this temple this yeah. is, this green place is what you get to visit but they've been discovering so many artifacts when they are digging up around these places. And if you look at the much bigger structure of this, this is a much bigger place which has been encroached completely by people who live there. Right. It's like a huge acres and acres of land dedicated for building this temple. Right. And it's been like shrunk so much. You would see that, and it's a clear proof that the distance between these structures and the distance... Um, between these structures and the river is what proves that how big they are. Right. If you look at this Miamisburg, you would see what I'm talking about. This Miamisburg is located here. There's a 10 mile difference between the river and this Miamisburg. Right. So we are talking about a big complex that was connected. To, right. That should was have had a 10 mile radius. Giant thing. That's all houses right there. Correct. It's all houses Off between to the left. We're yes. looking at the Miamisburg, Ohio, USA, upper right of this slide, and. What Vijay's kind of pointing out here for us is that that river is 10 miles away. And so that being the case, you know, these complexes probably connected all the way from that big conical mound all the way to the river. And we just don't have any evidence of any of these things because the settlers came in and, and started reforming and, you know, building their settlements. It's I, I might be exaggerating when I'm saying 10 miles, but it's definitely more than five miles. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we can infer when you connect right. two different places information. The information that is missing in the mounds in the U.S., I'm able to grasp those, those information from the pyramids in India. Yeah. The, the very critical information that I'm not getting from the Indian pyramids, I'm able to get it here. Yeah. So this is what happens when you connect the dots. Wow. You get a wholesome picture of what this is and why this is and so many other questions are answered. Right. That's the whole point of connecting these dots. So let's get connecting more dots Please. here. So 
some of other the other similarities I found between these things, they are also much important because this <coughs> obelisk is one of those things that I want to bring up here. Yeah. This obelisk is, it's, uh, it's like the center of this pyramid itself. Yeah. Like if you consider the pyramid complex as the center of the civilization, I would say that the obelisk is like the antenna of this pyramid complex through which the whole civilization gets all the vibes from this temple. Right. And this obelisk is everywhere. It's a transmitting. It's transmitting energy also. from the temple. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they are. I don't. I don't I'm, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no because it'll sound mythical. Yeah. I'm again looking at logical things here. Um, These are things I've felt uh, about obelisks, and especially in uh, a, the uh, main temple there in in uh, Egypt. Uh, it's, it's escaping my mind right now, but it's the one where the, the largest obelisk in the world uh, sits in front of that uh, giant, huge complex. And there is water running underneath that because it does flood. So it'll flood and the pyramids down in the ground. And at times that water comes up and it, and it floods because it's just kind of in shambles. Right. So they probably had that all dammed up and walled up and we're using that water to come in. And they find these big, giant quartz bathtubs. Right. And that's where they're putting the waters going into there. And so you have these, like, ritual bathing things happening by this, um, gosh, why can't I think of it? We're going to get back to you. It's going to pop in my head. Okay. And then I'll just blurt it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's where that giant, huge obelisk, and it looks like there's uh, machining that's happening in the hieroglyphs right? because they're right angles, just perfect right angles. And you get really close up on how they carved that obelisk. It's just a head scratcher. It looks like there's tool markings inside there. Right. Um, but, uh, but here in Ohio, you just don't see the obelisks. Because they've been dropped. They're gone. There's supposedly one down on the cliff, which I hiked to and saw for the first time uh, last May on me and my wife's anniversary trip. And uh, Ross Hamilton and Jeffrey Wilson have talked to me about this. And we hiked down there on the Brush Creek and saw that big stone. And it does look like it's been shaped. And uh, supposedly it rings like a bell when you tap it on the top. But it looks like it was just pushed over the cliff. True. I mean, it's right up there. You can look up and go, oh, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It really does look like it was just tossed over the edge. And so you'd think there would be more, but there's just, are they, people are taking them and using them for foundations or, you now, know. Th those are not construction material for the people who robbed them. The people right. who, I'm using the word robbed, it, even if it's harsh. For sure. Because, so this this obelisk is not just a material of construction. It's, it has a power in it. Right. Uh, there is a reason I'm telling this. I'm not telling him a mythical thing again. This is from the history. Yeah. The modern history, I'm saying. We'll get to that. Um, about these researchers who are researching here in this country, I appreciate them for all, for all those things that they're doing. But one thing is that they are finding it so hard to connect these things with the outer world. So all the researchers that I've talked to here are kind of caught in a bubble thinking that this is a, a civilization by itself. Yeah. They're not even able to get out of this. When I propose an idea saying that this is not this, this is that, it's bigger than what you think, it's not getting into their heads because they can't think beyond that. Yeah. Nobody is. All yeah. the people that I met, I don't want to mention names, but all those people, some of them even got offended just because said it's not a... Um, could, it's not a structure from this era. That's you, I think you're wrong because mm -hmm. these structures, these kind of structures, were built long time ago. Yeah. And I I propose saying that I, I suggested that they think out of the box, out of the U.S. box. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough Very for tough. all the people. Right. And in fact, I'm suggesting these things with the evidence that I'm able to. You know, if I'm able to just pr present one evidence or two evidence, it's hard to believe. But I'm presenting like series of evidences, like a right. well, bunch of them. If I'm, you don't have evidence, one thing you can do is compare it to something you do have. Correct. So you have information and knowledge encoded into temples in India that 
you know, Hindu scholars and people like yourself have been really interested and passionate about for thousands of years in understanding. And then you come to a place like this where there's feels like there's this devoid of information and people are kind of just creating theories on whether it's like the Hopewell or the Adena. We really don't know who the who they are. So we're just gonna name them after a couple white guys. Right. And so it kind of, you know, I'm not a scholar. I don't, you know, I'm not but I have a gut feeling when I can look at something like places in India or Egypt and I can compare them and I'm walking around. I have the same feelings you do when I walk around these places. There are very strange similarities. Um, you know, the serpent is just in, encoded into so many cultures around the world, whether it's India, Egypt, it doesn't matter. You will find serpent iconography everywhere, the Mayans, the, the Incas. So just that one thing connects all these civilizations right. not not even the, the pyramids and and right. the temples themselves that just one icon can connect things right. to where you can kind of you know make some conclusions for yourself about you're going to be mind blown cultures. by the rest of the things Let's, that's come in mind I'm, yeah i'm derailing um, us again right no you do it <laughs> <laughs> i like to listen to you <laughs> so it's good so this obelisk is not a modern thing, but it's in the modern history. The reason that I'm saying that is because this obelisk is known to uh -oh. the Freemasons, uh -oh. the Freemasons who built the capital of this country. Almost all important places in the world, like the Washington DC, the Vatican, and yeah. so many other modern places that we're talking about. They have obelisks, them, yes. by the way. They have Everybody. the there's, there was even an attempt. Yeah, there, there was even <laughs> there an attempt <laughs> to bring the obelisk from all the way oh, from Egypt. Right. This well, was, they have one at, at the Vatican. Correct. They have uh, uh, Saint Peter's Square. Yes. In as, Paris. Did, it, did I do that right? My fact check that. All of these, this obelisk that is sitting right in Washington D.C. Right. Was brought all the way from Egypt. Okay. People spent money on Months this. Months journey to get it Correct. there too. It's such a risky affair to bring a big And it didn't of. crack in half and they didn't break it. We're not sure. Something happened to this and they put it on a hold. Mm. That's why this is oh, not the center of the obelisk. It. Right. I, I watched a whole a big um, documentary about this. And okay. There, there's something that's behind this that happened that they did not use this as the main obelisk and they decided right. to build an all new obelisk. Right. So we, I don't, I don't want to get into that. I'm just trying to tell you why obelisk sure. is important in any culture that's being started. One thing I always wondered, if there's such a fight against all these old ancient civilizations being connected, then why are the people that are in power so obsessed with other ancient civilizations and their obelisks and taking their right. stuff for themselves? Right. Like, if we're not going to admit that there are similarities, then why are you connecting with, why do you want this obelisk in Washington, D.C.? That's such a legit question. Right? You'll never get an answer for. Never. Yeah. So well, and the whole Washington, D.C. is a pyramid structure. You would right. still see the ponds that I'm talking about. Uh -huh. You would see the whole uh, pyramids sitting inside a square complex. Oh. Everything is there. And this is also Lincoln right Monument, by the river. Jefferson, they're all monuments. Right. And they're all temples. Right. And the ge geometry of how those the streets are laid out. Correct. And where the Capitol is and the White House. And it's there's um, six-pointed stars, five-pointed stars encoded into all the roads. I mean, you can look it up on Google Maps and see just how all those crisscross. Correct. I'm just throwing this example for yeah. people to go and do their own research. Mm -hmm. Look at how this is right, sitting right the by the river. Yep. This is also right by the river. Absolutely. So I'm just the saying Hudson. that this is a known information. Everybody mm -hmm. knows Her. this, but they're just keeping it away from right. us. And some of the other things that I'm talking about Atomic. in this, like in this uh, um, similarities between these structures. Well, go back to that one. Yeah. This what uh, was, um, sweat lodges and ponds and how certain temples are dedicated for medicine, mm -hmm. how the Native Americans also use these mounds as the place where shamans practice all the medicinal things. Sure. And Herbs and, and plants. And correct. They did everything to do with medicines right. in this place. This place also acted as a seed bank. When I went to uh, Serpent Mound, I discovered that all the mounds are like are the center of places for farmers those days, where farmers 
the Native American farmers come to this place to get the seeds from there. This is where they take the seeds from during the spring equinox and plant them and get the yield out of it. Right. These seeds, they say, are charged seeds. Right. They are charged with so much of energy that they will produce so much yield, they say. Right. The same thing is happening in and India. Supposedly they grew massive plants. Correct. The yield is double. Massive fruits and, and, right, Ross Ham, our friend Ross Hamilton talks about that in his book, Star Mounds, where he thinks that, you know, they were producing this mana, this energy source with sort of all the earthworks and mounds and were pretty much like a, a giant circuit board to send energy to different temples and different places. Cool. And um, the, the seed bank is interesting because... They're aligning it to the equinox, which is when you're going to plant, and then uh, the spring equinox, and they're also aligning a lot of these places to the fall equinox, which is the harvest. So it makes sense that you would go to one place, hey, everybody's got to meet over here at the Miamisburg Mound or the Serpent Mound or wherever it is, and we're all going to get our seeds, and then we're going to go plant. So, And you're saying in India, there's temples that have seed banks. You were talking about that earlier. Correct. That's in, like the primary thing that they do on top of the, the temples or the pyramids that we're talking about. This place is where they say And that's the, the upper left-hand image on this slide here. Correct. And what, what is that temple called? This is called Mahabaleshwar Temple. Okay. It's in South India. This is just one of those 10,000 temples that you would find in India. Sure. All of them serve the same purpose. This is where they save the seeds. This so many times get hit by the lightning. There is a specific type of metal wow. that they use to build this. They call it the kalasa mm. in Sanskrit, kalasam in Tamar. This is, this is one of the most important places because this also act, act as a lightning, lightning uh, arrester. Right. So, and this metal gets charged so much, this sells for millions of dollars. Mm. People rob this even wow. to this day. Um, nobody knows if it's true or false, that they have magical powers, but people are ready to pay millions of dollars for just this piece of wow. metal. This is where they store the seeds. Look at how they have the same similar purposes for these mounds across many other, many countries, many continents of cultures and other things. Right. And this has been happening over so many thousands of years the same way, just like how it's happening in India. Right. So I, I cannot uh, not see this connection. And I'm seeing this. It's mind-blowing. I, I cannot see it. This is just a coincidence. Right. After Once a you see it, point. you can't unsee it. Correct. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> so there are other shaped temples too. They're not just ridge top and um, yeah. conical pyramids. There are pyramids that sit on top of a mountain. Yeah. You would find a similar uh, um, ridge top pyramid right in uh, Cincinnati. Right. It's... Oh, down by the by the river, there was a giant complex there mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Here too, we have a Mound Street. That was a fifty footer down there. Right. That just in the nineteen hundreds got torn down when they built the river banks up. Wow. Because there used to be the whole uh, Franklinton area, okay. which is on the other side of the river of downtown, used to flood, and wow. hundreds of people lost their lives in the early nineteen hundreds in a big flood down there. Okay. So those mounds were all down there still. But when they built that flood water or those flood walls, they had to tear that whole complex out of there. Wow. And there was the confluence of where the Scioto and the Olentangy River, which meets right at downtown, where there's a park called Confluence Park. But that's where that huge mound complex was. It was on one side of the river where downtown is, then on the other side of the river where the confluence of two rivers come together. So that whole area was a giant, huge site. And there's sketchings from uh, Squire and Davis, um, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. They actually have some sketchings in there of, of at that time. I think it had already wasn't in its glory by that point. A lot of it had fallen apart. Um, but Cincinnati's very similar where the uh, Miami River meets the Ohio River. Right. And there was a, a giant complex there. Right. And it's just all city. Yeah. Buried. <laughs> yeah, it is all. One one mound has survived, and it's sitting on in in the downtown. I went there. Right. I saw it. it was amazing to see that. Wow. And it's on top of a mountain. That's like the tallest place in the whole city. If wow. you're standing they there, you would the get to see the whole city. That's built there for a specific reason. It's like Sacred. the lighthouse of right. the city. Right. This 
this is another type of mound, mound or pyramid. There are similar mounds in India too. They are built on top of mountains. They serve different purposes. But right. when you look at different cultures, they, they seem to be serving the same purpose right. and the same style of building and everything. <sighs> this is getting, getting deep. And blow my coffee. What do we have here, BJ? This is a 30 feet old obelisk from South India. But this is not a obelisk from 1,000 years, 2,000 years. Uh, it looks old. This is from the Stone Age. Wow. This is something that I wanted to share with you to tell you that the obelisk culture or the pyramid culture is not thousands of years ago. Could be more than that, 50,000, 60,000 years, 100,000 right. years. Going back way back to other ages of where civilizations can build, 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 reach this sort of what they call their golden age or Correct. what they call in the yugas. Correct. And then eventually they fall. And then eventually, like we're coming up into our civilization. Right. Who's to say that that hasn't happened over and over and over again? Right. What evidence would there be left? except stuff like this, right. that's stone and isn't just going to get washed away. Right. I mean, where's the evidence of metallurgy? Where's the There wouldn't be that much left. Right. The only thing that would be is giant stone pyramids. Right. And so it's just, that's what you have. Right. You're not going to find pottery. You're not going to find, you know, someone's cloth or, you know what I mean? Even the metal is going to degrade huh. back. If it's a 50,000-year-old civilization... That's all going to be gone. Yes. Except the stone. These kind of structures, yes. Right. This is something that I wanted to bring up to just to tell this could be an evidence of the civilizations going back to many thousand years than how it is being taught to us. So I just wanted to tell people about this. Uh, our community needs to know about this. So what's in it for me is basically telling us why should somebody know about all these temples? Why should they know about pyramids? Why, is there any need, personal right. need for somebody, a human being for these things? Why should they even learn about all these things, spend their time trying to research or just even visiting these places? Is because of the psychological, the physiological, and the life science knowledge that they get from these places. That's the right. most important part. Those things might have been lost here in the mounds in the U.S. because of how the right. way they've been demolished. Yep. But the spiritual value of these places still remain. Yep. That, I think, is the reason that these places have survived so many yes. invasions and so many other things. And yep. they are still there for a reason. Right. Trying to convey an important message and also to give us the, to feed us the spiritual energy to us. They wouldn't have spent that much time aligning them so perfectly mm -hmm. in the geometry, the mathematics, if they weren't meant to be here for a long time for us to then, well, we don't really have their language, but we have these pyramid structures and we can learn a lot from their geometry and their mathematics. They're telling us a story. And if honestly, if you don't know the past, you really don't know where you're heading. So that's why I think it's important for us to go through this kind of stuff because we can look back and go, oh, wow, this is where this culture dissolved. And this is why we don't, we see these splinters of other, other cultures and eventually that connection with this whole thing kind of gets lost over time. Correct. But then in the future, people like you are saying, hey, look at all these things. Look at all these similar things. These places are telling us a story to people in the future to reconnect with what they perceived as, you know, this, maybe it was a higher civilization and they perceive maybe for us that we need this information. So they encode it into these big pyramids and temples. Correct. There are so many ceremonies that the Native Americans do, even the Hindus do, that they don't know what the reason is. All our ancestors, our elders, just say that, just do it, because it's got something that we are not able to explain, but right. just do it. One of those important things is that they say, do not live in a place where there is no temple. Mm -hmm. It's one of those important, do not live in a place where there is no temple means you're not just harming yourself, you're harming the whole community. You could be having a communicable disease. 
just because you're not doing what everybody should be doing to sanitize themselves. Mm. You're a threat. That's a very strong thing to say that do not live in a place where there's no temple. Right. Same thing applies to everybody here too. Right. The way that we are right now with all the things going on in the society, these are some things that we have to go back and retrieve. And the amount of knowledge that we have in this pertaining to this mounds and the other things related to this is what we need right now. We don't need Facebook or other things to do other things. We need all those connectivity to do this because this is more important than many other things that we are doing right now. So that's the important reason that I'm bringing this up. I wouldn't spend so much time of my time unless this is so important course, to the community. Of course, man. Yeah, I can tell. You've been putting your heart into this. This is another thing that we already discussed in our first episode yeah, yeah. about the Kundalini Yoga and how the chakras work. Right. A lot of people know that. This is one of those information that came all the way from India to the US, like in many other countries. All the people know about chakras, yeah. um, how they work. And many people who don't believe in chakras um, in their early stage of life started start believing about these things in the later part of their life when they right. do yoga and their body aligns and other things. Uh, when other things happen to their mind, uh, their spiritual uh, mind kicks in. Yeah. So this is another knowledge that we have to look into right now because the health part is lost because of these chakras misaligned. So the health part is lost because we fail to keep our body healthy to put these chakras in an al alignment to keep our mind strong. So these are all one big cycle of operation in our body and mind that starts with these chakras. So mm -hmm. all the yoga that you do puts all these chakras in place and your mind and body aligns. And after that, you can get spiritual or not get spiritual, but you still get to live a good life. Sure. So you don't, the way the people see yoga here as a remedy for all the problems and meditation for all the remedy for all the problems and how it is presented here, it's so absurd again. Yeah. Because... That's not how yoga is done. That's not what yoga is done for. Yoga is not done as a remedy. It's done as a, a way of life. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you see here how Kung Fu is taught, and if you see how Kung Fu is taught in China, mm -hmm. you would see the sport version of Kung Fu in the US. Yeah. And a Chinese monk who's learning Kung Fu for 30 years would highly criticize this because oh, yeah. it is being taught by somebody who spent a couple of years in China and learned the basics of it and coming back here and teaching right. it in an artificial setup. Mm -hmm. That's the way the yoga is done as well. If you see yoga, how it's done, uh, they, they do it on a yoga mat, which is plastic. Right. <laughs> That's not how it's done. You have to connect with the earth when you're doing yoga. In the grass, on the not ground. Not even on the grass, on the dirt. On the dirt. On the dirt. Okay. Or on the sand by the beach. That's where you do yoga. Yeah. I'm just saying one example of how it's, it's done here and how wrong it's done here. Right. There are so many other things like I want to like, harshly say it's wrong. Stop yeah. doing what you're doing. Even the horoscope of uh, peop uh, astrology and all yeah. the other things. That's not how it's done. Right. How astrology is a very complex mathematics that involves astronomy. And that's why astrology gets kind of uh, labeled as kind of a woo-woo. People don't take it seriously yes. because it's kind of been, you know, Vedic, the Vedic astrologers and some of those. Like you go back to that time and because it's it's much more connected with numbers and mathematics and it, it's more of a science than right. kind of this – Prepackaged. It's it's a very complex mathematics version of what we have Correct. now. That that kind of mathematics can be done only by people who are gifted to do that mathematics. Right. Not me. Not me either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know a person who who's um, very bad at mathematics. Yeah. But he's very good at astrology. Mm. My family astrologer. He is not an astrologer by business. He works for a bank. He's a, he's a very rich person. He comes from a very affluent family. Yeah. He has that gift, just like how certain kids will have mathematics mind sure. just by themselves. Yeah. Just like that, his, this person, he can predict so many things and just he writes letters letter to my father. He says, this is what's going to happen. And my father collects all the letters and puts it together and shows me after it happens the date on the letter and the incident would be like, wow. 
And wow. that's astrology for me. Okay. And here the astrology where they say, oh, you're born between May 15 and June 15, so yeah, you have this sign. Yeah, numbers are all, yeah. That's, that's not it. You, when you're born, there is a particular time frame which, within which you're born. It's a 15-minute time frame. In that 15 minutes, if you're born in that 15 minute, you are aligned to a star. And you're aligned to a planet. And you're aligned to a particular time period. Right. So this is what your life would be. This is what you should be doing to keep your life balanced. That's how astrology works. Okay. So all of these things, just like how you play this telephone game, when you say something in somebody's ear, by the time it reaches the end, yeah. it's like totally a different thing. That's how it comes to the West when right. it comes from anywhere in the East. Right. So... That's one of those things that I want to stress here when I'm talking about chakras, when these people say my yeah. heart chakra is beating, my throat chakra is yeah. coming out, my this yeah. chakra. That's totally <laughs> absurd. That's not how it works. People cannot feel chakras. If you're feeling chakras, no, it's something wrong with your body. Go see a doctor. Yeah, your it's, hearts can give right. out. Or <laughs> right. So, and the reason, another reason that I'm talking about these chakras are this, this chakra information is all around the world. This is a Tibetan fire serpent. This is also something that we discussed in our last yeah, episode. Yeah, I remember this image. Yes, look at this image. You would uh, anybody who see, sees this as a symbol would see the most important part, which is the curly end on yep, the bottom, the spiral, and how it has seven bends in it, mm -hmm. and how it has a platform on the top. The number one is the platform that I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. This curl indicates where the energy is stored. Right. And this seven bends in indicate the seven chakras through which your energy should be channelized to your head. Right. This platform is your head. This is where your consciousness lies. Right at the top, the T. Correct. Yep. This is more of your sexual energy. The spiral. I not say exactly your sexual energy, but yep. it's more Down of your here. sexual energy. When you channelize this and send it through the chakras and send it to here, this is when you get enlightened. It's the Tibetan concept of this. Right. I've experienced... And that's like the caduceus in the, uh, the, the logo of our modern-day pharmacy here mm. in the U United States. Correct. Is the two snakes. And that's representing right. the serpent and uh, the flow of energy. Right. Ask them why and they won't give an answer. No, nobody <laughs> seems to know what, why the snakes are in there. Right. <laughs> so this Tibetan fire serpent is the same as the serpent that we have in the serpent mound, is what I'm saying. Right. This is not even a serpent. Even the Tibetan fire serpent is not a serpent. It's just a representation of how right. your energy is stored and goes through your body and it comes to your head when you do your conscious kundalini yoga. It is the same as this. I don't see a difference. This is not a serpent either. People here know how to represent a serpent. They know how to build a serpent. Yeah. It's, it's not a serpent. This specifically has this seven chakras here and has a curl here for the storage energy, how it has a platform here where your soul detaches from your body. Yeah. This is so the, nicely depicted here. Yeah. You won't find this kind of a representation. This might be a crude representation of this Kundalini Yoga, mm -hmm. but this is a perfect representation of Kundalini Yoga. Because wow. this is not represented in any other place like this. Right. If you go to uh, villages in India, you would find serpents, uh, structures almost everywhere. Right. Every, any place you would find this. Right. It, it has its own history of itself. I mean, it's it's a serpent, but it's not. I mean, it's a serpent because the serpent just is representing, it's the symbol for the kundalini energy. So it is a serpent, but it's, I understand what you're saying. And uh, like you see here, this is uh, ancient Hindu art. Not just Hindu art. Okay. This, well, that's, this is okay. Hindu art. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, Cambodia where they represent a seven-headed snake here. This is also Hindu art where Lord Vishnu is represented by the seven-headed snake. This means, basically means it's he's enlightened. Right. If you have seven snakes on top of your head in ancient symbolism, this means Buddha is enlightened here. Okay. So it's like a position that they give you. It's like a crown that they put on top of your head. Right. Saying that you got enlightened. Right. This is from Mexico. Yep. I've seen that image. This is That's an wild. amazing representation of the same thing. This he it is a god. I don't know which god it is. It could be Lord Shiva or Lord Vishnu. Could be any other god. I need to 
do a research on this. Yeah. But it is representing the same thing. This is also from India. They're all talking about all these human beings that enlightened and became gods. Right. They and reached a point of through their, their practice. Correct. And to become enlightened. That's what they want you to do when you go to Serpent Mount. That's why right. they want you to come to Serpent Mount. It's a Mount. machine for enlightenment. Correct. They're asking you to do Kundalini Yoga mm. and become God. And sit on the spiral and do yoga and meditate and pull that energy through yourself Correct. to have what? A spiritual awakening? Mm -hmm. A consciousness shift? I mean, what is the purpose? All the people who come there... It's a pilgrimage place, correct? Yes. Like everyone's coming here to do yoga? Is that what you're proposing? Good. You use the word pilgrimage. Yeah. This is a pilgrimage yeah. where people come and gather knowledge about yoga. Yeah. If I say yoga, it might be, uh, it might sound strange for you because I'm talking about yoga in the U.S. thousands of years ago. I'm okay with it. I, I'm I'm not going to, I mean, this is all, I'm, I'm just taking it in. I'm not going to discount anything. I mean, this is all, it, it, I mean, it's hitting right here that there's something to that. I mean, that we talked a little bit of, about this in the last episode. And I mean, it just, I see these images and it, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, a spiritual person Not throwing as well. it in the dirt for any, not at all. Good. I believe in logic, though, because yeah, I want people. There's a to balance, though. Correct. I want people to see the logic. Got to be all open, but you got to be able to. Be, you got to have some skepticism. Correct. You, don't be a skeptic, because that kind of is its own religion. And I've always felt, you know, be skeptical. Just try not to be a skeptic. Have an open mind, and you know, this is compelling, very compelling, isn't it? Yeah. What else we got? These are a couple of people who believed in Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga is not a myth. So Now, we've got Charles Ledbetter here. Correct. And we were talking about this the other night when we were on our phone conversation. Correct. And I, I let you in on uh, Charles Ledbetter. His, uh, he's a protege of Madame Blavatsky. And she started the Theosophical Society Correct. and actually got a lot of her uh, information from living in India for years and years and years. In her book, she talked about finding these hidden masters, yogi masters in India that would levitate. She had all kinds of stories. A lot of people discounted her, but um, she came back with a whole, whole ton of information and started the Theosophical Society. And then I believe Charles Ledbetter actually split off. There was a schism, and he went and, and started his own Theosophical Societies. And you said... That one is in India? Yes. That was started by Charles Ledbetter? I think it was started by Annie Besant. Okay. Lady Annie Besant. Right. There's a whole uh, location but named after her with name. That. Okay. Yes, he is. Yeah. He wrote over 60 books about yoga and other things. Yeah. One of those important things that he covered is the Kundalini Yoga. Okay. Yeah. Madame Blavatsky was very much into Kundalini Yoga as yes. well. Yes. Yes. It's for people to experience it. Yeah. People, I, I, no, we cannot force anybody to believe in something without being without experiencing it, and it's not good to do that too. People have to experience and right. find it for themselves. They will become like these people who experienced it and then believed it, which is stronger than just believing it, having right. a blind faith about something. The, on the, this person on the right side, Carl Jung, I'm a big fan of him because I'm a student of psychology, yeah, and he is like the second father of psychology. He's the student of Carl, uh, is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. Sigmund Freud is considered to be the father of psychology. Mm -hmm. He kind of disproved all theories proposed by Sigmund Freud. Yeah. Sigmund Freud kind of took the basics of all the psychological things. Carl Jung proposed many things to disprove him and became really famous. Yeah. And he believed in Kundalini Yoga so well. Yeah. I can't believe that a person who is into psychology has approved of this Kundalini Yoga. And that makes a lot of sense. And he is an extremely logical person. When he doesn't find a logic in something, he disproves it. That's what he's expert in. That's why he's famous. He approving of this is a backup for this Kundalini Yoga for the right. people from the West. I'm going to believe it anyways. 
because I have experienced it. For people who want to experience this and being skeptical, they should go read about Carl Jung and find out why he was approving sure. of Kundalini Yoga and then go into that with a little bit of faith in that and so they, they can involve themselves in these things and then learn about these things. Sure. This is going to be mind-blowing for you. Okay. So this is the location of Serpent Mound, the map location of Serpent Mound. Okay. okay. So it's um, 39 degrees and 83 degrees in west. When you change this 83 degrees in west to 43 degrees, it goes to the east. That's what happens when you do change the digits from the second coordinate. It goes to the east and it goes right into this country called Turkey. Mm. Turkey is a Middle East country. Yeah. This place is called, guess what? Salman Naga. Mm. Naga means serpent. Serpent, yep. Okay, so the Nagas it, were like right. half people, half half human, half serpent people. Naga just means snake. Okay. In India, they say Naga. Okay. Means snake. Okay, so this place is called Salman Naga. Does this suffice to believe that this could be connected, these and two that's places? that's in Turkey, wow. That's in Turkey. That's like a long yeah. way from here. and that's here. even far from India. Yes, it is. This is not connected to India. I'm not even talking about India right. here. Right. I'm talking about how Serpent Mound is connected to some other places in the world. Look at how the Serpent Mound is also located right by a river. Mm-hmm. Right, because this is not a serpent mound. This is a mound right. complex, right. just like the other complexes. Rest of the things have been destroyed. You can even find houses right by serpent mound. Right, they are probably sitting on pyramids. Right, it's the same here. This place is also by a river. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. This is a desert. There's a river running here. Wow. Okay, so I know you're not convinced because that's not <laughs> enough to connect these two places, right? Yeah. So this is how Bring it looks. Bring me in deeper. Here we go. Right. So this is how it looks in close-up if you want to see that. Okay. You don't have to do much. Just change right. the coordinate from 83, minus 83 to 43. That's all you do. Just this one digit. Minus 83 to 43, right? And you end up here. Wow. Let's see some more things here. This is how it looks on the globe. Okay. All right? Wow. Like so far away, like pretty far away. This is Serpent Mount here, right here. Yeah. Minus 83. This is Salmanaga in Turkey, 43. Okay. So what else do we have? This Salmanaga is just 70 miles from Gobekli Tepe. Oh, boy. Okay, it's 70 miles for some people. For me, it's just 70 miles. Looking at a big global right. thing, it's just 70 miles yeah. like from here to Cincinnati or maybe lesser. This Gobekli Tepe, a lot of people know about this place. For yeah. people who don't know, yeah. this is a game changer in archaeology. Oh, yeah. It kind of blew the whole academy. It actually changed of, the history books. Correct, it did. Yep. All of them were believing that civilizations were 4,000 or 5,000 years old. Some people proposed some Indian civilizations from 10,000 years old. They did not yep. take it. No. This one is a game changer saying that they this know place it's is older 10, than 10,000 years old. 500 years, yeah. And a lot of people suggest that it's like more than 13,000 years old. Right. It's like way beyond anybody. Yeah, before the Younger Dryas. Yes. Yeah. And look at the technology in which they used. This is mind-blowing. And this place is only 70 and miles And they buried it. Yeah. I'm coming to that. Why would, I mean. They did not bury that place. Continue. Yeah. Yes. They did not bury this And this, this only place. a tiny, tiny fraction of other temples that are circular that are all over, still buried. And those are all, like the one that they have, there's more of those that are buried as well. And right. they're all one giant complex. Correct. It's crazy. These places were not buried intentionally. These places, to me, they were all buried by the flood. Okay. The big flood. Right. So it's, it's very easy to... Visualize how these places, even the Giza pyramid was buried under the sand. Right. For yeah. many, many it, thousand I mean, there's years. There's sketches in the 1700s Correct. of it. The sand was all like up to that top of the head. You right. can barely see the the uh, the Sphinx. So what do you think about this place that is here, the Salman Naga? I don't know. I think geologists can tell that it was actually intentionally buried just because of the way that the the geology is. That if it was naturally covered up with a flood, 
I feel like the displacement of the rock. I don't, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the verdict is out on that because I'm pretty certain that they think it was intentionally buried, but I could be wrong. Uh, to protect it or preserve it is what I've understood it. To it's be. really hard to bury it because it's so yeah. big. Right. This is just one we piece of the know. structure, yeah. and it's like a really, really big hey, piece. That's and a good point. And the same with this place too. I strongly believe that this place needs to be dug up. Yeah. The Salmanaga has the to be Salmanaga. dug up. They are definitely going to find something here. Right. Because of the other thing that I'm going to tell us. Is well. there a temple at the Salmanaga? There is no temple there. Okay, but That's you think I'm there's saying, something there. I think there. there is something How did there. you find out about Salmanaga? You just saw that the Naga was on the end of yes. the word? Yes. And you were just like, oh, okay. There should be something. I wow. do my research as big as... I see what you did here. Okay. Continue. I, I do my research is based on something that I'm not, a, uh, right. not able to disclose You're just here. like, oh, let me change the number no, no, no. by That's four. No, not what I'm saying. No, but you're saying like just to see what that coordinate was. Yeah. You just changed and then it ended up That's what I'm at talking that about. point. Okay, I, I, I see I did not change did. it by accident. Right. I did it I because of something else that I'm not able to explain here. I understand. But yeah. more things to come on this, more and more things to prove that this place has to be dug up. This is in the middle of the desert, but... Yeah. This place, do you know that Serpent Mound is sitting on top of a fault line? Yes. You know? Yes. So what is a fault line? And it's uh, on an ancient, inside an ancient crater too. Right. So this fault line is because of a crater that was formed because of a, an asteroid that fell on mm -hmm. Earth in this location. So do you know where it fell? The asteroid fell? Oh, gosh. What's the town? This is where it fell. Right. This is where Serpent Mound is. Right. Okay. So this place... That's the upheaval there, the slide on the left. Correct. The images on the left. Yeah. So this Serpent Mound is located right from here. From right. here, look at the angle of where it fell. Yep. So this place in Turkey, the Salmanaga, is also located in the same place, in the same angle where there was a crater. Hmm. This crater fell recently. Hmm. Can you believe that? I put those black lines for like a guiding line right, for right, you to understand the angle in yeah, which yeah. they're located. Wow. Wild. Yeah, that seems, I know, I mean, Serpent Mound being there, it's not an accident that where it's at, being inside that crater. There was something sacred about that. What is sacred about it? <sighs> they are trying Number, to It's up on the cliff on that plateau. And just the directional, yeah, go ahead. They are trying to locate the kundalini of the earth. Mm. We are sitting on a conscious planet. Okay. You are sitting on a big body, just like your body. Gaia. Or my body. Yes. This earth has its own consciousness, has its own blood, own body, own breathing system. Everything that we possess in our body. You and I are a result of... The sun and the moon having sex. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can prove it. Okay. A male is always sexually active. Yeah. But the female will not be sexually active for three day, days a month. Mm -hmm. Perfectly aligned with the moon. Yes. Same cycle it follows. Our consciousness is a result of the sun and the moon having sex on earth. The earth is a reproduction of these two things. And we are all beings on the earth, just like how the earth itself is. These people were connecting the kundalini of the earth itself. This mm. is what it proves. Wow. This is not an accident. I shouldn't say so. I am here for a reason. Yeah. And this is the reason. Wow. And when I go back, I'll have a different reason. And you will follow me there. Okay. <laughs> Bring the strange crew to India. That yeah, would be stranger crew to India. <laughs> it, it, take us to those those temples that you were showing me earlier. Yes. yes. <laughs> those giant complexes. I would love to be there. And it would help me just see exactly and feel that, you yes. know, some of the things that I've kind of come to my own conclusions about and, you know, connect it all together. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be. This crater was not formed thousands of years ago. This okay. was formed only a few hundred years ago. 
This earth itself is like a magnet. It is a magnet. It's not like a magnet. It is a magnet. Right. So it magnets poles. act in a certain way. Mm -hmm. When we see something falling, we are looking at something falling on us. It's our perspective because we are standing on the floor. But if you consider earth as a magnet, things are fall attracted to it like a magnet. This magnet has its points where the magnetism is higher. Right. That's where the asteroids will fall. That's where it's falling. It is falling here. And they know that, so they have formed a serpent mound here. Right. It is, it is falling here. And there is history of other asteroids fallen here as well. And they have formed something here which needs to be dug up. The reason that I'm saying that this needs to be dug up is the same reason that you mentioned that the, Kun, the Gobekli Tepe was dug up. It was under the floor. Right. It's like 20 to 30 feet. If you look at pictures of Gobekli Tepe, mm -hmm. oh, it's people down are standing hole. on top yep. of it and viewing the whole thing on the bottom. Yep. What do you think would be there sitting there in this point? There is definitely something there. All right. Anybody know anybody with like millions of dollars? We can go on an ex, ex on a good old fashioned dig in Turkey. Right. That's what you want to do, huh? Uh -huh. You want to go dig this place up? Of course, yeah. At least do a lidar scanning and find out what's uh, in there. Yeah, absolutely. That'll be easier. No, much uh, easier to do. We need to have an expedition mm -hmm. to Turkey. Yes. Okay, so... Uh, whoa, we, Kyle and I went to a mound similar to this, uh, uh, Etowah Mounds in Georgia, okay. on our way back from a gig in Atlanta last uh, November. Okay. And uh, they were three flat-top mounds, kind of like what you see in Go Cahokia, very similar to this, but really advanced construction. I was surprised how big they were, right? Literally 20 yards from a river. Okay. Giant, huge river, which they're using for... Uh, it's one of the largest, um, they use it for electricity. So they've got a big dam upriver, and it's just, uh, uh, you know, they're using it for power. And then you have this mound complex that's right next to it. What were they using it for? Power, right? Right. <laughs> the similarities are crazy. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Because of the reason that I am not able to derive some uh, evidences that, that I already believe in. I'm presenting only the things that I have solid evidences of. And I'm not a researcher. I'm more of a spiritual person. So I don't have access to so many information. If I get an access to all this information, I'll come up with a lot of things. That's yeah. the reason I'm saying the researchers here, I can say that they are they're not very smart. Okay. They're just thinking inside the box. You got anybody you want to call out? <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to. <laughs> just testing you. I don't want to, but you know, yeah. you know, you should be open to opinions. I'm open to opinions. I, yeah. I've been to like three three countries. I've seen so many things. Mm -hmm. So I have the advantage of being in a different geography, a completely different right. geography with a continuous civilization that is that is going beyond twenty thousand years. Yeah. I, I mean, hey, man, some people get locked in their own bubble. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get out of. Right. If you have a certain thing that you've, hey, we're on team this, it's really hard to break away from that team. You lose your, you know, your mentors. You go a different direction. The people right. that you came up, you know, researching these things to find out later that, well, there's new information. Some of this might not be true anymore. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for people to let that go, especially when you've written books. You've been teaching classes for 20 years at the university about this. New information comes in, it's not always that simple to just, well, sorry, we were wrong. Yeah. You know, with Gobekli Tepe, though, it really turned all that because mm -hmm. their, their big thing was where's the civilization before 11,800? Where is the civilization? We don't have evidence of it. Then Gobekli Tepe comes along. Well, here's your evidence of that more ancient civilization. Like you said, they were trying, maybe India was. Uh, temples in India were, nope, they aren't that old. Then they dismiss it. So it really is the smoking gun. It is. They, they hide so many information for political reasons. They don't want people to get enlightened. They don't want people to get together. That's a whole thing to discuss about. The reason that I bought this mound, this mound in particular, is it because the name attracted me. The first thing that attracted me in this is the name. It's called the Kolomoki Mounds in Georgia. Okay. I've heard this name somewhere. I know for sure that I've heard this name somewhere. Then I did a little bit of research. And I was wondering, oh, what are all these people doing here calling themselves researchers? Yeah. Like, there is a place called Kolomaki in Greece. So I wanted to go back and find out if there is anything to do with Kolomaki and Kolomaki. 
So we connected the first dot where we saw connections between the pyramids on how um, the Chilicate pyramid, all the pyramid yeah. complexes are yep. all the same. And then we connected the second dot where the Serpent Mound and the location in Turkey. Yeah. This is the third dot I'm trying to connect here. What's the Kalamaki in Greece? The Kalamaki is not just another place in Greece. This is like a four to 5,000 year old civilization place. Yeah. There's so many structures here that are so, much, so older than what we know and people are not even able to date. This whole base, the whole geography, uh, the Turkey, Sardinia, yeah. all these places, you just dig somewhere and you'll find something yeah, ancient. Cree, That's, yeah. It's like that. It, mm -hmm. you, the whole Mediterranean location is like that. Oh, yeah. Anywhere you dig up, you'll find something ancient. People are tired of digging up things there. Right. Yeah, there are so many people who are doing this as a hobby. Yeah. They come up with so many things and government doesn't have the time to approve of all these things. Right. So they just go without unrecord, record, mm -hmm. and no records of so all these So there's so much knowledge that's not even getting out to the public Correct. about research. Maybe it comes out in 10 years. Maybe. Then by then, you know, it's a lot of time has passed. We're behind. Correct. You know, we got to play catch up. Right. Look at how this Kolomoki and Kalamaki are located. This is not exactly the same location, but approximately. I put a dot on there for the North Pole. Okay. Do you see that this is like the same place? The Kalamaki so. is gone under ocean. Okay. Because the Kalamaki is a beach. So the real Kalamaki is under the ocean. Hmm. If you draw a straight line from Kolomaki to Kalamaki, they are in one straight line. Wow. One straight line. What? Yes. Wow. The word also means almost the same. What does it mean? It, Kolomaki means the land of straws. and Straws hmm. where you have grass. Right. Grass growing up. Sure. It's the same with Kalamaki too. Right. Not same, but similar. Right. That is wild. All right. These are some of these things that I'm proposing. Yeah. And there are a hundred more things that I can say, but I don't have the time to do that. Sure. No, this is great. This is the next dot we are going to connect. I was going through a lot of pictures of the Native yeah. Indian Americans, and this is what caught my eye. Mm. I like this picture. Yeah. Because She's doing yoga. Yes. Yeah. This... For many people, it's some kind of acrobatic. For yeah. me, it's yoga. It's right. called Purna Bhujangasana. Mm. Purna Bhujangasana is one of those important yogas that you do to awaken your third eye. Okay. It's like something like a snake that you do. Like how you how a cobra races. Yeah. You race the same way and you bend it. Purna means complete. This is exactly what he's doing there. This picture was not taken accidentally while he was doing something else. Those days, cameras need exposure for mm -hmm. a while. So he was doing that, and he was exposed to the camera for like at least two seconds to get right. that picture. She was holding that for a while. Yeah, it's a he, it's a shaman. Oh, that's a, that's a male, okay. Yeah, yeah it's a male. I'll I know he's my head. <laughs> doing yoga for sure. So if I tell the, that he's doing yoga, people are not going to believe because yeah. it just looks similar. So I'm not going to believe that just right. because there is another lady in the same position in yoga and he called it yoga. Sure. So I, I have to produce more evidences on that. That's when I came up with these things. Hmm. This is a 2,000-year-old Mayan artifact. Wow. Or much older, I don't know. This is called Simhasana. Simhasana means the lion yoga. This is where you stretch your tongue out. Wow, and he's and in lions like a puma suit or a big cat there no, suit. There are no lions in Right, South there's America. jaguars. Whatever they use, lion and tiger in India, they will use jaguars in, exactly. in the West right. for the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'll come up with another example for this, for okay. this too. Yeah, there's a lot of jaguar but, iconography in South America. Look at how this is also one important yoga he is doing. Do you find this similar? I find this similar. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm pretty convinced that they are teaching yoga here. Okay, so are there anything else? Yes, there is. This is called Baddha Konasana, the butterfly yoga, where mm. you do stretches. This is also an important yoga. Right. 
I see. He's got his hands grabbing his feet and everything. Whoa. This is Vipari the Salabasana. Uh, yes. I've seen this pose before. That's a tough one. Ouch. Now look at that. Wow. I mean, that's that's yoga. I mean, that that's they're depicting that. Wow. I've never seen that uh I've never seen that artwork before. That's wild. These are few of the hundreds of artifacts in found in the Mayan civilization. Even now, if you go to museums, you will find all of these artifacts sitting there. Right. You will find thousands of yoga positions. Same thing again I'm saying is that when you connect these dots, you would find all those lost things in India here. Mm -hmm. That's the advantage of doing this. Right. Because there are so many yogas that have been lost in India. You will find those things here. We can do a That's whole wild. big research about this. I've recorded uh, this in a in a community. So they were preserved here, correct? But they're lost in India. Wow, at least one some things were preserved here. <laughs> <Right>. You know, <laughs> accidentally, yes. Yeah. And it's accidental that they're calling them Indians too <laughs> for some reason. That is <laughs> weird. That's weird. Right? I always under I always wondered that they because Native Americans. A lot of times they'd like to be called, uh, depending on where you're at, but um, American Indian Correct. is a term of en en endearment instead of, uh, you know, being addressed as a, a, a Indian American or um, American Indian rather versus Native American. So I don't like to call an Indian Indian, a yeah. Native Indian an Indian, because that's a ex name given by an external person. They have their right. own names. Sure. They, have, they have their Lakota, they have their mm -hmm. Hopi, they have their own tribal names. That's how yeah. we should address. You, you know the reason that they are called Indians, right? Well, supposedly because Columbus thought he was sailing to India exactly. for, the, for the trade routes. Right. And he thought he landed in India, but really it was like more or less Puerto Rico or but something like that. It's West Indies. Yeah. yeah, the West Indies. So that's accidental, but it's also incidental for me for them to be called as Indians. Kind of brings it all back. Correct. Yeah. He connected a dot too. Hmm. Maybe he was in the know. These are some of the things that we already discussed. Yeah. So how the earth is conscious, how Serpent Mound is a very important pilgrimage. It is not a tourist destination. It should not be considered like that. I think all the people should go visit there at least once a year, just like how Hindus go to temple. Yeah. Should go to this place as a worship place. Absolutely. Treat that place sacredly and not go grow grass on top of that and hide it from right to a lot of things that needs to be done yeah research more about it in this perspective not as a burial mound yeah and find out what the energy has to give to the people instead of just uh, um, chasing away people after 5 p.m <laughs> right there's something other than the shape of it being a snake that keeps me coming back there i don't know what it is me neither. But I'll keep going back. Right? <laughs> that's that's the Because first. every time I go there, I meet somebody that kind of adds to the missing piece that I, maybe I'm looking for about it. I mean, that's where I met you. So It is complete. Yeah. Mike, it's already complete. This is what I'm trying to say. If you understand this, realize this, and then believe it, that is complete. The quest that is pushing you constantly to go back there... It's complete when you understand that this is talking about your Kundalini Yoga. Right. And this is for me as a person, is enough evidence for me to believe that this is representing yoga. After I find so much information about hey yoga. Hey man, I can't, uh, I can't say you're not onto something. You know, I think there's obviously, you know, more evidence is going to keep kind of coming in as if you keep, you know, turning over stones. Keep at it because I think you're close to something here. I mean, we've sat here and I've watched, you know, image after image that, you know, for me, uh, you know, I never make a full conclusion. Yes, it's this or yes, it's that. But I remain open. I always remain open, brother. That's good. That's what good else? To know. Yeah. <laughs> what else you got for us? Anything else you want to chat about? Was that the last slide? It is not. No? Okay. Get ready to... Let's go. Get mind blown. All right. Some more. <laughs> hit, hit me. So we are going to talk about a little bit about a language. Okay. Might not be interesting for people who are not interested in knowing about languages. But uh, for me, language is a single point of connection for all people. Yeah. 
when we were talking about how the whole earth is becoming one consciousness yeah that could happen only if there is a single language and that is what is happening right now how english is spreading right. across planets across continents and connecting this planet as a one consciousness right so if we propose the idea saying that this planet was conscious was a single consciousness connecting all the people together at one point there would have been a language that's common right this is mentioned by many people it's mentioned in the bible mm-hmm. genesis 111 that's what they say that there right. was a, i'm sorry genesis 111 that there was one single language right. the earth was getting too powerful and somebody did not like it right they destroyed the tower it. of babel tower of babel yeah they it's destroyed the language right that language became many languages and then the people dispersed and they people no longer dispersed. had their unified civilization Correct. they all went into you know out to india to europe to wherever right so some people went and started building a civilization that's when they started making bricks the first mm. bricks can be found in indus valley civilization yeah, yeah. that's where they went right. some other people went yeah all of the people spread across this is according to the bible right this paranormal researcher his name is alex collier he's a very interesting guy he was talking about so many things mm. he was completely silenced he went out of the limelight all of a sudden he became so famous all yeah. in such a short time period he he said that he was talking to aliens hmm. different breeds of aliens he was talking to who are giving different kind of information yeah i'm not i'm not going to say it's something unbelievable i'm not going to say it's believable after the experiences that i've had yeah i would say it's believable sure but let's not discuss about it right. let's dis- discuss only about logical things here yeah. i want people to believe in this so i want to propose logical things here sure sure so he says that one point at one point we all spoke the same language just like how it's mentioned in the bible mm-hmm. and he says this language is called tamir this tamir is from south india mm. that's what i speak right it's very interesting because there is a big politics going on between tamil and sanskrit mm-hmm. the people who follow sanskrit say no sanskrit is older than tamil and then tamil says tamilian says it's older than sanskrit right to me it's not like that to me it's sanskrit is just another form of tamil and the actual tamil we are reading now is also another form of the actual tamil hmm because i'm not saying this because without, without any evidence here there's a couple other people who researched on these things these are not just people they are not old people that you're looking at they are like they dedicated their lifetime just for this right their whole lifetime these are academics i'm not talking about paranormal research sure these are legit guys in university correct they are both doctors yeah he is a sumerian language researcher okay sumerian is the oldest dead language in the world right so if you go back and find out what's the oldest language in the world sumerian Sumerian is where all the information came from the bible the vedas so many information came only from sumerian tablets yeah all the information about the kings who lived for 400 Kingsless, years 500 yeah. years everything came from sumerian and he after years and years of research says that sumerian is archaic tamar hmm it's the archaic version of tamar something happened all the people died and the whole thing was reset and the people clung on to that language they re rejuvenated the language and brought yeah. it to the tamil that we are speaking now he says okay it is the same with sanskrit too i believe hmm it's a branch just another branch of yeah, this yeah. old language that okay. was spoken once which is called which might be called tamil or we can call it sumerian sure but what we need from that is the information in the language there is so much information that you won't believe it can solve all the problems in the world right now right any problem pandemic yes we can solve it psychological problems yes we can solve it physiological problems solve it anything we can solve overpopulation we can solve anything we can solve every information is decoded in songs in tamil and wow one of the first things that people do when they invade is destroy libraries right yeah they just recently destroyed a library in sri lanka oh. that had 5000 year old books in there what yes. who destroyed Thousand. it it's the government that destroyed it. it's like the uh, you know i would say it's a variable government that destroyed it 
Wow. The new regime that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's ridiculous. So this has been happening for so many years that we have lost so many information. But the good thing is that we still have so many information that has not been decoded yet. We know it, we study it, but we don't decode it as information. We just sing it as a song. Right. We use that to praise God. We don't know what exactly it means. We, people are not doing researches on that. Very minimal people are doing researches on this, trying to decode the information from this. Right. He is not the only person who is saying this. This is Dr. Asko Parpolo. Asko okay. Parpolo is a doctor in Indus Valley script. Okay. He's called an Indologist or hmm. Sindologist. Indology means the study of Indus Valley civilization. He again dedicated 30 to 40 years of his life. He is still contactable. You can, if you want to contact and talk to him, you can talk wow. to him. He's in Finland. He is saying that Indus Valley is Tamil. Hmm. We can arrive at one point with all the evidences that we have saying that this is the oldest language. And why do we have to know that? Because of the tremendous amount of information in that. It has information about the right. flood. It has information about uh, metallurgy. It has information about who you are, who I am, who the world, what the world is. Right. It has information about every religion. Everything is there. But it will take a lifetime for you to study all these things. Sure. But it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. If you have the quest for this, yeah. And not the quest for Kim Kardashian. Yes, it is definitely something that you Amen, be brother. In. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell him, VJ. Yes. <laughs> this is one of those things that I wanted to bring up. This, this, on the top, you are looking at Indus Valley Civilization script. On the bottom, you're looking at the second line. Wow. You're looking Easter at Easter Island, Island script. Yeah. Wow. Indus Valley Civilization is in India. It's on uh, India and Pakistan yep. region. Absolutely. The Easter Island is in Nowhere, like the it's middle the middle of, of nowhere, of nowhere. Yes. It's in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean. Ocean. <laughs> Nobody knows how this language went all the way up there. This is one of those scripts that has not been decoded yet, just like Indus Valley Civilization script. Right. A part of that has been decoded by Asko Parpolo. Okay. And part of uh, the Indus Valley, um, the Easter Valley, uh, Easter Island Civilization has been uh, decoded by some people. Yeah. We don't know what information they have for us. It'll be very interesting to know if they have any similarities. Wow. But look at the way they are so similar. Oh man, that's ridiculous. That's crazy. I mean, even as far as these these shields that are holding out, there's right. like different versions of it. Mm -hmm. Like you have the one with the three spikes coming up. Mm -hmm. Man, that is interesting. Wow, that's so similar. Where did you pull this document from? Is this from one of these guys' books? This is available on Google. Okay. <laughs> Most wow. of the information is available for open for everybody to research. Dang, this is cool. You just have to think in that perspective and research, you will get it. Wow. You just have to Google Indus Valley and Easter Valley Civilization. Yeah, Valley I Civilization. mean, Easter, Easter Island, Island, they thought the Moais were just heads until they just recently started digging them up and realized that there's giant bodies. So they're like twice as big, if not three times as big as what they originally thought. Like, we just now decided that it's a good idea to like dig down in and see what's there right. i mean come on easter island is a point of a big puzzle yeah a big theory it used to that be has a been... bigger land mass around it and correct. it's just the top correct that's we're going to look more into that now yeah lemuria because, yeah it might be a very small piece of land mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere but that kind of gives us an evidence of a bigger puzzle right When we are looking at the language, Tamil, there are some words that came from Tamil to English. I wanted to make it interesting, so I took the word serpent. Yeah. It comes from the Tamil word called Sarbam. Okay. Sanskrit called Sarba. That's the reason I'm saying Tamil, Sanskrit, and all. Right, Both are the right. same. Just sure. a different version. Yeah. In English, it's called one. In Tamil, it's called wundr. Hmm. Same, three. Say Tiri. Tiri. The trident that uh, Lord Shiva has yeah, called, it's called Tiri the, Sulam. I saw the trident iconology right. or the, um, the whatever that script was earlier. Right. Eight is yet in Tamil. That is unbelievable. That's very close. Nine is called Navam in Sanskrit and Tamil. That's Nav Navagragam, they say, for nine planets. Yeah. It's Navam. Okay. Decimal, the word decimal comes from the word dasamam. 
That's very close. That's too close. Yeah, that's super close. I put this word for a reason here. There's a word catamaran. called catamaran. That's a sailboat. It's a canoe. Right. It's it's called kattumaram in Tamil. Mm, that but, is no really right there. That's not a word that came in the pre in the old times. This okay. is a word that was derived in the 19th century. Okay. I wanted to put to make sure that people do their researches properly. Wow. This term was coined by the British people after they saw people riding a small piece of wood. And mm. they, call, they asked what it is and they said katamaram. They started saying katamaram. Wow. So if you do the research properly, all these words, we don't know how they are connected. E right. Except this word. We know how this word is connected. It's not to be confused. The word mango comes from the Tamil word manga. Mm. The English call it mango. Mango. Because right. it happened in the recent times. We know how it got sure. connected. Yeah. There are so many other words like that. But these words, no, we don't know how they were connected. That's wild. We are going to go dig deep into this. Then I started doing more researches and I found that there is an expert who has done researches already in this field. Look at the words in North America. This world, like. lake, is called Eri. It is the same in Tamil, it's Eri. Hmm. We don't know how it came. That's wild. Chamakattai. It says, Chamakattu means, it is the old name of the place Salem in North Carolina. Okay. It's, the Salem word comes from Shalom, okay. which means resting place. Right. The original Native American name for this place is Chamakatta. Hmm. Chamakatta means flat land in Tamil. Sama means flat or same. Wow. Katta means land. It's a very common term that is used when we speak. Kamachi is a place in Canada. Okay. There is Kamachi means holy mother. It's the same exact word. Yes. It's but what the, yeah. This, these, these words were found by the researcher that I'm talking about. Okay. There is a, there's a word, there are a few words that I found. One of those words is, is Tutuveni. Okay. Tutuveni is the name of a place. Tutuveni is mind blowing. Trust me, it changed the whole perspective of Native Americans for me. It's like the beginning is Serpent Mound for me. The end is Tutuveni for me. Mm. I'll tell you why. In a, okay. in, a few, in a few slides, I'll tell you why. Okay. And again, Aya, the word Aya comes from the Aya mother in Tamil. It's just the same. Pachamama. Pachamama is the god that they did the ceremonies recently Absolutely. in Vatican. Yeah. Pachayamma is a Tamil word. Mama is Amma in Tamil. Right. Same thing with shaman. The, the religion, one of the wow. sects of religion, so Hinduism. Cool. Yeah, Samanam comes from Saman. Shaman, Shaman is the opposite of Kaman. Shaman and Kaman are two brothers who were the other people who were traveling in the ark while Noah was traveling in the ark in another direction. Sure, sure. These people were traveling towards North America. Hmm. Kaman and Shaman were asked not to have sex with their wives to keep uh, the holiness. They were asked not to do anything because if they get pregnant, it'll, times will, will be difficult. Right. So we don't know if the world is ending or beginning. Right. So they don't take care of a baby. Right? Yeah. So he was told not to have a baby. Shaman kept his word. He was holy enough not to do that. But Kaman did it and he became the love god. Hmm. Kaman is called the love god. But nobody worships him because he disobeyed. Wow. Shaman is a person who is holy, who has given up his personal desires for the reason of some holiness. That is where the word shaman itself comes from. Wow. In the Native American culture. Okay. Wow. Much more mind-blowing. So I started digging all the words in Native American languages. These are, this is a Kariai tribe word. Okay. The Kariai tribe calls water as tonni. When I ask for water from my mother, I say, bring some tanni. Okay. You see that? Yeah. The mandahuka. That's exactly the Mandahuka same. is itself a Tamil word. Manda means head. They say for hand, they say kai. Okay, that's the second Same there. with my language. I say kai kudu means give me a hand. Okay. Wow. Kavishana word for water is avi. 
means waterfall aruvi okay man means appa appa is father right papa papa yeah the word papa came from appa sure father came from pita in sanskrit just like that the the tribe maravar the marava in the native indian is the same as the marava tribe in india there wow. is a tribe called marava in india wow. this is this is the information about the marava tribe in india it says the tamil community of the state tamil nadu see right there dang that is this wild is, yeah this marava is from from the native american culture right. their god is called marga wow their god is called murga yeah i mean it sounds it just sounds like like hindu words it right? sounds like wow and it, they're spelled similar also right i mean that's are you are you convinced please tell me no so i can show you more slides i mean i'm i'm getting there <laughs> i'm getting there? I'm, i'm getting there i'm not quite okay, there okay well, let's travel some <laughs> more on this so he is a researcher that i was talking about his his name is called orissa balu i'm a big fan of this guy i am so eager to go back to india to meet him he has found over 6000 words all across the world that comes from this language wow all these words that i found also he could have found out already i'm right. just saying the word kamachi is something that he kind and right. said that this is a tamil word wow he is ta- he is telling a different uh, theory saying that the tamils traveled all over the world but for me it's not like that i think it's the remains of the previous culture which spoke the same language but they started reconnecting as the land uh, became smaller and smaller because the oceans becoming bigger sure but their people were traveling they kept in touch with their brothers all the time so it is not uh, it's not something for me to even think of think of if i have to believe or not i believe it because yeah. it's already there yeah. and i meet a native indian person i'm able to easily connect with that person sure the food that we eat the mexican food that we eat oh, it's, it's just indian food it it 100% it is you, coriander you know that because you've eaten yep coriander and uh cilantro and i mean just the way that mexicans braise their meat and you know it's it's it is it's very 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 similar the it's both very use a lot of spices and and peppers so yeah lots of lots and lots of uh my wife's um uh, half indian her father's from uh dacor and uh gujarat so you know when i met her we started eating indian food and when you're looking at the naan and the tortilla and you've got the spices and it's just it's it's it really is mind blowing so similar it's ridiculous this is another turtles all the way down want to connect yeah the turtle mythology is a very important mythology in india and in china they say that the land is on top of a turtle's back sure it's on, floating through the cosmos they say that, swimming right? through the cosmos you know that a yep. lot of people know that if they uh, they study hinduism they will come across this and mm-hmm. they they might not be able to believe it yeah the hawaiians uh have a tradition of there's turtles underneath the earth and then another turtle and another turtle and another turtle right. and it's cosmic turtles carrying the earth uh through the universe this is exactly what he's saying he's a native indian brother Mm-hmm. he is explaining you should see this Turtle video Island. if you had it yeah yeah his name is jacob jacob wawati if i'm pronouncing it right he is explaining how the whole north american continent is a turtle that is transforming into an elephant hmm and how that is making impact to the consciousness of the people who are living on top of that and to the entire world and how it's all connected together right i was mind blown when i saw this because it is so making sense it did not make sense when i read the turtle myth from india and china okay it makes sense when he was explaining in this that is the reason i'm saying context, that when you connect you right. see the whole picture yeah yeah you see what i'm saying absolutely this is a very strong connection for me you people might not think it's uh, you know very important but for me i'm going in a track the first thing that i saw the engineering connections between the mounds mhm the second thing that i saw the cultural connection between the places and then the geographical connections between the places and then the mythology connection between these places yeah and then the language connection these places 
and then we'll go to another one soon. Okay. If you have the time, please watch this video. Yeah. He talks really slow and he explains everything perfectly. Sure, absolutely. What's yeah. the name of the video? We can have everybody. It's, that's the name you have to Google. Okay, the right there. Yeah, Alaska we can actually right add that. Right, um, you should. Yeah. Well, actually, I'd like to contact this yeah. guy and maybe see if please he can. Please do, yeah. If maybe, you're able to contact maybe him. Maybe he wants to come on and talk about it and we can cut him into the show. Maybe, yeah. If you, if yeah, you contact cool. him, please connect with him. I'll, I'll loop you in. Oh, <laughs> yes. 100%. We could do I'm, something virtual. I'm so eager to meet this. Yeah, we could make that. We could try to make that happen. I think that actually needs to happen. I'd love to get you guys on camera, even if it's just virtual. You know, if, you know, I know you're going back to India and everything, but as long as you got to, well, you're going to be off the grid for a while, right? Yeah. You said you're going to be. <laughs> Checking out, yeah. getting reconnected with your uh, with your your yes. your being, if you will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, that's gonna be awesome for you. So, why should we learn about this language, this mythology, and other things? Is what I'm trying to tell in this. It is very important that we know a language because well, until thirty years, you will enjoy the life and everything. After thirty years, everybody will have a quest inside them about trying to find out who am I. Yeah. Why am I on this little piece of rock hanging in the space? Right. That is something that will come to everybody's mind. Right. That is when the search stops outside and goes inwards. When it goes inwards, it is your consciousness that you will be researching about. Be you, even if you don't wish, you are constantly researching about your own consciousness. Yeah. The whole meditation, spiritual practices, Hinduism, everything goes back to your own consciousness. Yeah. If your consciousness is not there, there is no point. There is no witness to all of these things happening. Right. So that is the point where everything connects. Right. So when you are researching about your consciousness, I will compare the consciousness to a computer. If you take yourself as a computer, there is hardware, software, and there is something called firmware. Hardware is what you can physically touch and see, like your body. Like your brain. Anything. Yeah. Your body, your whole body is a computer. Mm -hmm. Like there is input and output, light input, sound output, everything is there. Right, right. The software is your brain. Okay. Right? Your consciousness. That's the program. Correct. Your firmware is your chakras. Firmware means the software that is In used to operate update the hardware. Update the software Correct. with. That is the program in which the hardware works, not the consciousness works. Right. Operating system and firmware are two different things. Okay. Your chakras are firmware. Firmware, okay. Your consciousness is your operating system, the Windows or the Android or anything that you take. Yeah. So when you're writing an operating system, what do you use? You use a language. Right. Coding language, C++, whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever it is, it is a language that is used and the language is using codes. Mm -hmm. symbols and all can, these temples are all coded you I'm, I'm just telling you that this language the language that we have to research the Tamil or Sumerian or whatever language itself it is a code of your consciousness mm. if you are able to research the information provided in that language you will go back and find out who you are wow so do I have to learn Tamil you don't have to. Okay. <laughs> that might take to. a bit, man, unless you're uh, willing to give me Zoom lessons. You are asking the right <laughs> questions. You don't have to learn Tamil. You okay. just have to take the information that has been translated from Tamil. That's all. Okay. You have to take the information that has been translated from Sanskrit. Yeah. It might not make 100% uh, sense yeah. when it's translated, but you will still get what you need. Yeah, I mean, I've been interested in the, Ved in the Vedas for... Forever. I mean, a lot of the ancient Sanskrit text has just been always been on my radar. You know, it's uh, it's just something that I've been passionate about, and to kind of see how all that, um, the Indus Valley civilizations, and and how even just the languages of Native Americans and things that are similar to our English language in Tamil and Native American languages. It's just it really. Is, I mean, you've blown my mind today, man. You have not disappointed. I will tell you that. This is great. Good to know. But, I mean. But there is some more to come. Yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> keep going. Remember I was telling you about Tutuveni? Yes. Tutuveni is one of the most important places if you are a cave painting. Oh, yeah, I love cave paintings. If you're interested in cave paintings. Mm -hmm. Tutuveni is located in Arizona. 
Yeah. This place is called Newspaper Rock because huh. it looks like a newspaper sure with so does. many... Sure it does, right? It's like writing. It looks like writing. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a general question, like a friend. So somebody writing something again and again, like repeatedly. Yeah. Who would write it and why would they, why would they write it? Well, I used to have to write lines when I got in trouble on the school bus. Right. Over and over again. Right. It was a penance, essentially. So it's not a newspaper. I'm no. saying it's a school. Right. Tutu oh, learning. whoa. Okay. Right. You just blew my mind. Right. <laughs> Tut it, so am I making they're, this They're up? like writing their ABCs over and over it's, and over again, like my daughter who's in, just in first grade last exactly. year does. And writes her A, and writes an A, writes an A, then a B, then a B, and it's all lined up. Wow, the, that is wild. This is only... 100%. The, that makes sense. This is only totally. the tip of the iceberg again. Okay. You know, they are saying, they're literally saying here that people, when the young men, they, they become, they come of their age, they come here, mm -hmm. they go through a ceremony. Right. Which is definitely a school. Yeah. They're learning about something in this place when they come of their age. Right. Since their childhood is over. Right. Now they're going away to college, basically. Something like that. Yeah. Right? They're learning not just the hunting, fishing, and other things. They're learning something more important. What are they learning? And who are these people? These people are called Gopi or Hopi. Oh, the Hopi. Wow. I'm saying, okay. I did not say Gopi by mistake. No. Okay. I said it, it for a reason. Is that like uh, a Tamil word? It is not a Tamil word. It's okay. a Hindu word. Okay, I'll tell gotcha. you why. Gotcha. This Tuttu Veni is, the, Veni, the word Veni is as often associated with Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is an Indian god. Yeah. His disciples or his followers or his people are called Gopi. Hmm. Okay. That's just the beginning. If you are a disciple of Krishna, you're called Krishna Veni. There is a river called Krishnaveni in India. Hmm. There is a river called Tutuveni in here. And these people are called Gopi or Hopi. Wow. Okay. That is crazy. That's not the, not, just not those connections that I'm seeing here. Yeah. I researched more about it. Mm -hmm. Then I found that Tutu means somewhere where you can find water. It's mm. In Tamil, they call Wut. It means water source. So they have resided here to form a school. That's what I saw. Right. When I did research on these Hopi and Gopi, these are the Gopiers, the depiction of Gopiers of Krishna. These yeah. are the Hopi tribes. Okay. It was mind-blowing when I found that the god of Hopis are called Kachina. The Kachinas, yes. The Krishnas for me. Yeah. Kachina, Krishna, These that's very close. These yeah. are Krishna's disciples who have come all the way here. Wow. And they are still following Hinduism. Wow. It's pretty compelling. Right? It's fairly compelling. I'm not going to say one way or another, but man, if you're you got not my okay. mind turning here. You got the gears turning, BJ. Right? There is Look at one that more. dress. I mean, their yeah. dress is, I mean, they're wearing saris on the left, but you could consider... That picture on the right is like a version of a sari, right. and, you know, a robe, yeah. and the jewelry, and just, it, you know, the Native American uh, art, just that's incorporated into their style, mm -hmm. and obviously Indian, uh, mm -hmm. like the most beautiful kind of blinged out uh, garb than yeah. anybody in the world. That's, that's quite incredible. When I found that their name, the god's name is called Kachina, I concluded. Yep. I, always, I have a little Kachina at home. Kachina. A little Kachina statue that sits up on my shelf. That is Krishna statue. <laughs> that we have a Krishna. <laughs> it's by a Krishna statue. Because my we have uh, Ganesh okay. and uh, Krishna. Okay. And then right next to that is a Kachina. Right. So I didn't even know that. Go back and tell your family. Go back and tell all your people. Yeah, I just put it there. <laughs> they, they belong next to each other is right. what you're saying. Right. Wow. Cool. One interesting thing that I saw in this cave painting, and that that is the point where I cannot unsee anything at all further. Okay. That is this cave painting. What? 
What? That's a stork with a guy in his mouth. It's a giant stork. Yeah. It's bigger than the humans. And that's depicting a story from Krishna. Exactly. Wow. Tell us about the story. Krishna is, he can be called the Indian Jesus. So he was born of a virgin and similar. He has some similar things that kind of matched up. So many story. similarities. Yeah, it's yes. a lot. From the from his time of birth to the end of his death and everything, it's connects. Right. Not the Jesus that that came to India to study. There are multiple versions of Jesus. Right. This Krishna, the Christ Krishna, Kri Kri. Right. Krishna is who I'm talking about. Both of them, when they were born, they were feared to be becoming the king. So mm -hmm. the, at that time, king, it was Herod in uh, um, in the Roman civilization. Yeah. It was Kamsan in Indian civilization. Both of them started killing babies, mm. all the babies. It's the same story. Right. Krishna was also the same way. But still, they were born. Right. And they were not born of human fathers. They were born of their celestial fathers. Both of them died at the age of 33. Both of them had uh, so many other things in common. I, I don't want to discuss certain things here for sure. religious reasons. Sure. So many other things that, you know, how he did miracles when he was younger. Yeah. How Jesus did sure, miracles. Sure, the healing. Yes. Mm -hmm. and Krishna was constantly be, being... Uh, he, there was attempts to kill him, assassinate him. Sure. This is Just one like of those Jesus. assassination attempts that we are talking about where they the giant stork. A giant stork or something like a giant stork to kill him. I mean, that looks like a stork there on the left. That's wild, man. My brain just broke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm speechless. I really don't know what to tell you. That's wild. I mean, okay. <laughs> You're getting me closer to being convinced with this. You're getting a little closer, a little bit closer each slide. <laughs> <laughs> Do your own researches before getting fully convinced. Yeah, yes. and I mean, I want to dig into this more myself. Sure. You know, I want to kind of go on the journey that you did, maybe not as in-depth. I don't know if I have the time, but man, I'm definitely looking into that because I know there's more parallels uh, you know, there's parallels that I've come across that were just, you know, from the Iroquois to the Japanese and even other cultures, like I think we were kind of talking about earlier, um, just different words in uh, the Cherokee Iroquois language and, and letters and how similar it is to other cultures across the Pacific Ocean. And you're showing us examples of, of Tamil and Native American languages and even English words. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff, man. And I'm I've always felt that there is a more ancient culture that does tie us all together. That there is this sort of um, you know, this religion that kind of weaves through over time. It's gotten broken up and maybe moved over here and changed a little bit, and maybe there's a letter here and there that's different. But uh, you know, the artwork is the really the visual like this that kind of side by side when you present it this way, it really does kind of click something in your mind. So these are just a little bit of information that I can put into pieces and put into presentation form. I love it. But there is more to this, like extreme information that I'm not able to present here. Because of we political, do a, well, we'll do a part three. Reasons. Uh well, <laughs> no, nah, I don't. We don't need to worry about that unless you want to come to India. <laughs> hey, we'll come to India. We will come to India. Yeah. We'll make that happen. Yes, strange road road trip. That'd be great. Yeah. But man, whew. I mean, not sure where else to go. I mean, we covered almost everything. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, we have some depictions here of just Jesus and the Buddha and, and Krishna, or I guess that's uh, Lord Shiva. Shiva. Yeah. All these gods. And they um, have the halo and right. sort of the, the enlightenment right. uh, with this, you know, like you were saying, the snakes, but Christians mm -hmm. represent that as halos. Buddhists yes. have the kind of rainbow light yes. that's around them, yes. but it's all kind of depicting the same thing of, of 
spiritual enlightenment. There's, the names are Isana. so similar. The real name for Lord Shiva is Eason. Mm. He has the name of Shiva. He has, he's also called Ekanathan. Ek means one. Nathan right. means Lord. Right. One, one God. Same with um, Buddha. He's also called Isa. He's also called Lama. Right. He's also called Hemanathan. Right. And Jesus, the real name of Jesus is Isa. And Akhenaten, that's a Egyptian pharaoh's Akhenaten, name. Akhenaten, yeah, that's yep. that's one thing. It's Akhenaten and Akhenaten is right. like it's same to me. It's and, just uh, another version. What's yeah. the Sumerian guys? Uh, the brothers uh, Enki and en- Enlil. Enlil, yeah. En- Enki and Enlil. Those are Veracocha or uh, Kuku Khan. They're you know different versions, just different names, right. but. Potentially the same person. Same person, yes. And uh, even, you know, some of the Hindu gods have have that same shared um, kind of history and story as so many of these other figures that you see. Yes. It's wild, man. One researcher called pa- Pandian, El Pandian, I guess his name is, mm-hmm. he did a research on how Ekshua, the god from South America, is so similar to Lord Shiva. Right. And it's like all the same. It's Shiva, Ekshua. Yeah, Ekshua yeah. means, Ek means one again. Right. Shiva is Shiva. And he's called Ekshua. And same with the Is- Islam too. It's Islam is just another, the formless worship of God, for, of Lord Shiva, I would say. Yeah. People are just dividing us. We are all the same. We are still for worshiping the same God in different forms. I feel it more and more. I mean, as much as they, you know that they know that, we're all connected and all the same because they wouldn't spend so much damn time trying to divide us. Correct. You know what I mean? Like you get a sense that there is something that's really trying to just drive a wedge right. between all of us and right. say, oh, you're black, you're white, you're Indian, you're, you know, whatever religion you are, I'm this team, you're that team, I'm Republican, you're Democrat, you're left, you're right. And it's just how much more can we compartmentalize what we are? Right. We're human, right? We're all the same spirit species of being on this planet we're not that different what it boils down to is people have certain things that they need food shelter water but other than that like there's not much that divides us man and this really does kind of shed light on just the historical nature of a lot of these you know some people can say it's woo woo oh we're all connected we're all one man but when you look at this kind of stuff which is where i've really pulled those philosophies more than anything wasn't some like you know hippie guru dude trying to tell me that we're all one but just the research and the things that I've dug into that's led me to believe that is the case and experiences that I've had um, through various things and the Serpent Mound's always been a big part of that that's how we met this has been awesome I think we are getting to that point Uh, if we need to have a third uh, part of this 100%. 100%. We can make it happen. As soon as you get from get back from being off the grid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm going off the grid for. Yeah. To get just yourself rebalanced and and get yourself kind of back to uh back to square one. The so, main reason that I'm proposing this is that I don't want people who are who have blind faith. Yeah. Those people will and juggle you get between into anything. Fundamentalism. They, it's dangerous. Uh, if, if you believe in something, you should have the evidence for that. You should, your mind should accept, your consciousness, your subconsciousness should accept the truth. Then only you should believe in all these things. You can't just go to India and learn yoga and meditation and just come back and act like a yogi. And, and then call start yourself a, a yogi. That's, yoga studio and no, that, that's so, make a bunch of money. It's like a sin you're committing to your own community of people. Right. Telling that you're a yogi. The word yogi is a very powerful word. Sure. Almost everybody, somebody called me a yogi because I was doing uh, meditation there. And I said, I'm not a yogi. Right. You need to that come to word, India. I'll show you a I real yogi I will become a yogi there. and it's very soon. And then you, 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 do, you don't have to call me yogi. You, everybody will know right. that I'm a yogi. Right. But please don't call me a yogi because I have a long beard and I'm sitting and doing meditation. That, right. That's not right. what yogi is. Right. A lot of people call themselves yogi and yogi here. Yeah. It's hurting when I hear I, that I word. I bet, man. I bet. That's got to be a tough pill to swallow. There's only one reason that there is behind all of the, this whole network of people who are dealing with crystals and cards and yep. meditation and all these things. There's yep. just money. New age. People just... New age movement has always money. been profitable. Just, yes. Go down to a new age bookstore. You can buy a piece of quartz 
you know, a giant piece of quartz, you're going to pay $200 for that, for that crystal. And, you know, they have their, these sacred things and, you know, you buy a bundle of sage and it's like $20 for a couple little bundles of sage and some incense. So yeah, the new age books and, um, they've kind of taken bits and pieces from other ancient cultures and, you know, people like Madame Blavatsky and folks like that, that brought a lot of this information to the Western society in Europe and the United States, they just kind of started making it their own. And that's where it, it just leads astray. You know, the knowledge, the information gets lost as it kind of transfers hands. And then it becomes this whole other thing, which is confusing because if you don't know the root of where some of that new age stuff comes comes from, you know, like yoga, for example, and the Vedics, the Vedas, and and everything you've talked about, it's it's you know not those people's fault either. But um, again, it comes back to going back and looking at history to seeing where the, where we're going next. I really wish that this message goes to a lot of people, not because I want to become famous or this has to become famous, but for the reason that people should enlighten from this matter of getting deceived by all these fancy things that are being presented as yogic things. Yes. And the people who are profiting out of these things are doing it so trickily that once you get in there, you won't be able to recognize that it's a trick. Yeah. That's the whole point of the trick. Right. You, you kind of get engulfed in that and believing in that. The main purpose of trying to find out who you are in this world is not being served when you're doing this incorrect method of yoga and other things. Right. And when people do yoga and they are able to stretch their body completely, they are fully satisfied. Right. That's just the beginning. Right. That's not the end. When, when they the do physical, that's just the physical right. part of it. Correct. So that's the physical yoga is done to make sure that your body does not get sick. Mm. So your mental process does not, does not get hindered. So you can stay sharp. Correct. So if you keep scratching, you can't do a meditation. Right. So if you, if you have to heal it before you do meditation. Right. That's the whole point of doing yoga and get your body ready to go for that. Mm. The final journey is where what you have to be concentrating. All the people doing yoga are here doing yoga and they are done with that. Right. They, they are just calling themselves yogi. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, That's, let's change that, man. This kind of information, people like you... You know, I don't know if a lot of people really understand that. So it's good to have somebody like yourself that comes from the area where yoga was born to kind of set it straight. So I appreciate that. And if I always hope that if I ever have something wrong from another culture, please correct me. I don't know. And uh, I would, would, you know, love to make sure I correct anything I've ever said uh, incorrect about somebody else's culture. Um, so I appreciate you kind of setting the record straight in that regards, even with, you know, yoga and kind of clarifying some things with um, Hinduism and the connections that you see with ancient Native Americans here in Ohio. Like, amazing, man. I really, really, really appreciate you coming down. Um, again, part two. I mean, this was this part two. Part one was great. We sat down, had an awesome, awesome conversation in our old and what we call little bro zone. This is bro zone two point bro, everybody. And so you came in uh, with our old little small studio set up. We had a great conversation, but I can see you've been busy with this. I can see that you've really put in some some time and, and you've you've been obsessed, VJ. Um, Haven't you? <laughs> I can see you've been a bit obsessed with this. I love it. I love the passion, man. I'm not this guy. I'm I'm just a lethargic person who just wants to have fun in life. Yeah. So many changes happened in my life. So, and I know that I'm here for something. I saw something that I did not expect to see. Yeah. And I was revealed the purpose of my life. This, these are all boring things for me, <laughs> honestly. If, yeah. if you ask me two or three years ago, these are boring things for me. I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to put my mind in these things. Probably want to work out in the gym and like show off and. Sure. Just, that's not what I am now because of the guidance that I'm getting from somewhere else. I'm not right. going to talk about it because it's it might sound strange. Yeah. But I'm. I'm just saying because I'm on a journey. I would need people who are like-minded and who are 
pursuing this the way I am pursuing it, not the blind faint pursuing. People need to have the logical scientific mind when pursuing all these things so they can go and reach the correct destination. Sure. That's that that's a that's the whole point I'm trying to make here. And the people who I met here are really open to certain things that I can't find in other countries. That's yeah. one positive thing about thing about this country. Yeah. You know? A lot of people accept when they are wrong. They accept when they are ignorant. Yeah. They they are they have the quest to learn. Not everybody everybody is on a blazer working in a, in a corporate. Sure, there are sure. a lot of other spiritual people yeah. who have the quest, but they don't have the guidance. Sure, and it's not possible to achieve anything in this geography because of the way the society is. Yeah, you can't stop on the roadside and have a cup of tea. Right, which is possible in India. I can stop I by know. the roadside and have a cup of tea. Right, it's different. Everything's split up by highways and strip malls here, right. and big giant apartment complex right. that have that have been flooding our city right. with these big, ugly, horrific, giant apartment complexes that are luxury living that we have to look and oh, there goes another one, and it just sections everybody off because it's just one giant parking lot. So then you know, everything it just seems fractured. You know, you can't, like you said, just pull over and have some tea on the side of the road. The whole lifestyle itself is wrong, I'm saying. When you bring us to India, are we going to pull over and just have Absolutely. tea on the side of the road? I'm, I'm holding you to that, man. I'm holding you to that. Because <laughs> I want that experience. Definitely. Uh, and I hope you can give that to us. Absolutely. But, man, like I said, this was, thank you so, so, so very much for making Absolutely. your way to Columbus. Welcome. Um, the crew and I are, are super grateful. This is am, am, amazing information here. My mind's blown. You sent the slides in advance, but reviewing them, I knew that there would be so much more that would come out of it. And I was right. This has been an epic, all time, fantastic episode. VJ, thank you so, so much, man. Oh, I on. really, really, really appreciate your time. Um, and again, guys, uh, VJ, where can we find you? Where can we follow you? How can we, uh, if anybody's interested in this stuff, where can they get a hold of you? Uh, honestly, I don't know. If I'm going off the grid for at least six months. After okay. that, I'll in be... six months, you can get a hold of VJ where? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on Facebook. Okay, sure. cool. Uh, awesome. You will be in touch, so I'll be in touch with you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Well, guys, that's it for us. Uh, it's been another amazing episode of The Strange Road. Everybody, you can follow us at The Strange Road on uh, on Instagram and Facebook. Basically, we're just The Strange Road everywhere. Anywhere you got a social media platform, we're there. So, again, guys, adios.